This is Trophy Gold, Castle Amber, part one. I want to, uh, first of all, if you're watching this video and you are curious if this is an ongoing campaign or something new, it is an ongoing campaign. Uh, you can watch the beginning of it um, in the OSR, uh, my YouTube list for Trophy Gold OSR, which this one starts with the Bruja, the Beast, and the Barrow, and then continues with Prison of the Hated Pretender, correct? And then uh, there's a one session thing called the Swirling Court. And now we are here at um, Castle Amber. So that's one thing. And then also, um, if you want to know more about Trophy, uh, check out the link at the, uh, in the description of the video. You'll find the link there for the pre-order page. So I want to just have us go around and introduce ourselves first, and then I'll jump into my, my overview. Um, so when I call on you, say your name, your pronouns, and anything else you'd like for us to know about you. I will start, my name is Jason. Um, I'm the publisher of Trophy Gold and I uh, host a podcast called Fear of a Black Dragon and that people uh, enjoy or seem to enjoy. And yeah, I love running this game and I'm excited that Castle Amber is a classic D&D module and I'm running it for my podcast <laughs> so that I can talk about it on my podcast. So, um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes. Uh, let's go with Drew. Oh, and my pronouns are he, him, by the way. I am Drew. I use he, him pronouns. I am uh, a fledgling uh, writer for Trophy Incursions. Hope to have at least one out within the next couple months. And uh, turns out I make character sheets too. So that's fun. And that's me. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, James. Uh, I'm James. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I have GM'd a fair bit of Trophy Gold and I've written a couple of incursions now, one called uh, The Source of True Papura and another called uh, Cutting Words. And uh, my character is uh, Horrorguest, who is a geomancer and dying elder who is slowly being consumed by a curse that is turning his innards into precious stones and his arm now is uh, largely made out of jade and uh, I don't think it's going to get any better from there. Fair enough. We are going to introduce characters as well when we're done with this. Uh, Jim. Hey, I am Jim Crocker. I use he him pronouns out in the world. Um, uh, I run and play a whole lot of games online. I've been a game retailer for many years. So anybody watching this that recognizes me, it's probably because you bought a game from me at some point at some convention somewhere. Um, hopefully I'll be doing that again once we get back to seeing each other face to face. I'm on Twitter at Jim Likes Games. If you want to hear me talk about uh, uh, mostly gaming stuff, that's what I've used social media for. I have done some content creation for Trophy. I wrote uh, an early incursion called the Flocculent Cathedral, which has been very well received. That kind of I, I think it's you know we're we're um, using. Uh, uh, we, we are playing an OSR module that uses that kind of harkens back to the days of basic D and D. Uh, and Jason has referred to the Flocculent Cathedral as the keep on the borderlands of uh, uh, trophy uh, trophy dark. So that that's very flattering. So it's it seems like it's something that uh, has been used to introduce folks to it. I wrote a trophy gold incursion called Top of the World that um, I got an honorable mention in the trophy. <coughs> pardon me trophy writers contest and i've got some stuff coming out in the trophy book a setting called the salt sea and um uh something that's going to appear in a future codex i don't know how much you want me to talk about that uh, know, jason we'll, uh, later <laughs> we'll hold that for now um yes yeah, so lots of trophy content creators on the call today uh which is fun uh okay so now we're joined by uh, a new player this week uh mike Hey, I'm Mike, uh, he, him. I make games at uh, esker.dev. It's my blog that I put stuff on. Um, I wrote a dark incursion called uh, Nemerensis's Gate, about um, a journey to the underworld, like you're, you're dead, but you don't know yet. Uh, and uh, yeah, I played, played gold once, but uh, excited to, to learn more about it. Fabulous, thank you. Okay, so I want to begin by doing um, a procedure called CATS. Uh, CATS is an acronym that stands for Concept, Aim, Tone, and Subject Matter. I like to do this just in order to establish some basic uh, expectations uh, for the group so that we all kind of understand at a basic level what we're going to be doing. And so the concept of Trophy Gold, Trophy Gold is a 
Uh, it's a fantasy adventure game. Uh, it's about treasure hunters going into the lost and forgotten places of the world uh, explicitly to find treasure. Uh, they are trying to uh, raise enough money to accomplish some very expensive goal that they all have. And um, the tone of it is very, uh, it should have a desperate feel. It should have, it sometimes has a grim feel. I don't know if Castle Amber will, <laughs> but uh, in general it does. And yeah, it's it's very similar to sort of, in aesthetic at least, to like a sort of classic D&D or like an OSR type game. But its gameplay is very much story game oriented. So that's important to know. Castle Amber is a classic uh, module from uh, Expert D&D. And it is, I don't wanna to say too much about it. Uh, I will say this though, if you're watching this video or if you're playing in this game, there's a good chance you might know something about Castle Amber because it is so prominent in the hobby. And uh, that's okay. Uh, it's not gonna diminish your enjoyment because I have remixed certain elements of it. And in any case, the risk roll will also remix uh, the story quite a bit. So I think there's still surprises to be had, even if you already know kind of how Castle Amber goes. Um, it's based off of, it's actually based, the characters and things are based off uh, uh, books by Clark Ashton Smith. And so it has this like very deep literary tradition to it as well. I will just advise you all on the call that it is not going to be helpful to impress everyone with your Clark Ashton Smith knowledge. Um, it's not gonna have any bearing whatsoever on the story. And so it's just gonna be obnoxious, so don't do it. Um, but uh, having said that, the module is, I do want to say that the module is incredibly weird. Uh, you are all going to be like, what? <laughs> it's a really, really strange, weird uh, adventure. And, and that's even, and like even more so, like think like you're, you might have an idea of how weird this is and like it's way weirder. Okay, so um, get ready for that. Um, but I, I think we're gonna have a good time, but, but it's, it's a strange time. So um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, in terms of our aim for today, after I'm done, I want to introduce the characters and then I want to uh, we'll just dive into play at that point. We might take a break, but then we'll dive into play. We'll play um, until uh, about 10 minutes until the session's over, in which case we'll do a little debrief session at that point. I, uh, I have this marked out for five sessions, uh, five long sessions. I think that's enough to finish. It's a pretty hefty uh, little adventure, but uh, we'll see. Um, in terms of the tone, uh, as a general matter, Trophy has like kind of a, it kind of vacillates between like high fantasy adventure, but also like kind of grim and gritty uh, dungeon delving. Uh, this particular module is very, um, it's just like it's it's like just kind of like gonzo D, &D. um it's very surreal uh it's very dangerous uh, i'll tell you that right now it's an extremely deadly dungeon <laughs> um and uh yeah so that, that's kind of it, it's it's a variety of tones i think we're going to get with this one in terms of subject matter there's nothing in the module that i think is worth calling out in particular about subject matter in terms of like problematic or you know possibly triggering content uh we're gonna have three safety rules on the table or safety tools on the table the first is the X card. The second is the open door policy. And the third is lines and veils. The X card uh, in this context, if something happens in the story or the game that you find to be objectionable for some reason, uh, you can say X card or type it in the chat and I will stop. I may ask you what is being X carded, but I won't ask you why is it being X carded. And we'll stop and we'll just take that thing out or change it or do whatever we have to, whatever we have to do to keep things moving forward. The... Um, Open door policy is really simple. If you are, if you have to go for any reason, uh, just go. There's no uh, explanation needed. You can just leave. And then the third tool is going to be lines and veils. Lines are things that we absolutely do not want in the story. Um, veils are things that we're okay with being in the story, but we just prefer not to role play them. And so I'm going to start by saying what my lines and veils are, and then I'm going to give you all about 30 seconds to either uh, tell me in chat or on the call, or if you want to go to Discord and tell me on Discord uh, what your lines and veils are, and then um, uh, and I'll make sure to convey it to the rest of the group however we need to. 
And so my line, uh, I've got one thing behind a line and that's gonna be sexual violence. I don't like to have sexual violence in my games and we're not gonna start now. And then I'm gonna put behind a veil uh, two things. I'm gonna put torture behind a veil and I'm gonna put violence towards small children behind a veil. I'm okay with them being things in the fiction. I just prefer not to role play that. So I will now wait about 30 seconds to give you all a chance to check in uh, with your lines and veils. And I'm watching Discord as well, if you prefer Discord. Okay, uh, so uh, I'll just direct everybody in the, ch uh, in the call to look at the chat because we do have a uh, line that was added and that should be totally fine. So let's, um, let's introduce the characters. So I think I wanna go around the table and have uh, the returning players introduce their characters first and then we'll meet the new character. I'm gonna go in the order of the sheet. So Drew, tell us what we know about Rebel so far. Well, Revel is a disowned heir turned witch, or probably wish a little before the disowning. Uh, his drive is to become part of the Swirling Court, which we actually got to visit last uh, adventure. That was fun. Um, his skills are homes, paths, rituals, and debauchery, as all good witches and disowned heirs have. Uh, and I start with a rune of three. So... That'll be, that'll be fun. Yeah, awesome. Um, I don't think I have any questions. I, I feel like I know these characters fairly well now at this point. Let's go to Orlin and her gentleman, Orlin. Tell us about Orlin, please. Hey, uh, so Orlin is a former gentleman farmer. My background is plagued farmer, uh, whose uh, farm came under, you know, the, the like the plague came and terrible things happened and the crops died and my family died. And um, now my drive is to renovate my crumbling estate. My current occupation is undertaker. So uh, I went from uh, taking things that were alive out of the ground to putting things that are dead into it. And that is thus far, you know, the, the story of my, of my arc. And but hopefully someday I get back to you know, uh, actually creating life instead of just, you know, uh, putting dead things away. Let's see how that goes. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, you already told us a little bit, James, but if there's anything else you want to add about Horagus, please do. I'll just pick up where I left off. Sorry for jumping the gun before, but uh, basically, in addition to what I said, uh, dying elder Geomancer, he has his drive is to pay the major so it can lift Garolan's curse, which is the curse of geomancers that you know causes slow transformation into stone or precious, pre you know, precious gems, uh, etc. And his skills are construction, omens, rituals, and sacrifice, a newly acquired attunement uh, from learning it from a geomancer called Onyx, I believe. He has two rituals, um, Brimstone and uh, Unfall, and his starting ruin is three. Fantastic, thank you. And now let's meet our new character. Mike, tell us about Sybil. Yeah, uh, Sybil is a magician and uh, a dancer, and uh, their drive is to acquire uh, Dread Forel's rebel fleet for uh, who knows what reason? Um, yeah, let's see. I took. They like to carve things. I, like when I took this, I, I thought of what carving doors in in stone, perhaps, <laughs> and uh, and parsing uh, symbols as as a ritual. Um, so those would be very useful. Uh, yeah, I I'm gonna find out what this who this character is. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally fair. Um, uh, great. Uh, yeah, I will probably, as we kind of as we get deeper into play, I'll probably ask you about Dread for Elf's fleet quite a bit. So uh, maybe be thinking about that as we go. Awesome. So we got through all the early stuff pretty fast. So why don't we just start playing? Let me grab the uh, PDF. Let me get going. 
Um, right. It has been a few months since the events at the Swirling Court. And you all have heard a rumor about a cave system near Fort Durham, where allegedly a group of bandits made their, their home. And the rumor, the salient part of it at least, is that something caused these bandits to run fast, quickly, get the heck out of there. And the thinking is that they might have left all of their ill-gotten uh, goods, uh, you know, in the cave system. And this is this is like a hot tip <laughs> that you all got. And so you're kind of following up on the hot tip. And so you've been on the road uh, for the better part of the day, trying to reach this cave system, not on the road, actually, you're in the full wilderness at this point. And so it's a little slow going because you're kind of going over hills and through, through brush and uh, tree cover and all that kind of stuff. And so I think it's probably like, you know, fairly late in the afternoon. The sun is still in the sky, but it's definitely getting lower. And this little wilderness journey is set. Um, here I will sort of highlight a sort of mechanical feature of Trophy Gold that I think is worth highlighting. Every part of the adventure is going to have what's called sets. And each of those sets will have a goal. And the goal is usually something that is out of character information. Like you as players know what the goal is, but your characters don't necessarily know. Um, but in any case, there's two ways you can go about sort of solving the goal. You can just do it in the fiction. Like if your characters just happen to do the thing then the goal is solved or the goal is met. Or you can cash in these tokens that you'll be collecting throughout called hunt roll tokens. If you cash in collectively three of them that automatically solves the set goal. So that's one big kind of thing about trophy goal to be aware of as we start here. But this set, and, and I'm just having it be this sort of journey through the wilderness uh, has the goal, the quite simple goal of make camp for the night. And so I am curious to start Sybil, what do you think, and the other players should pipe up if they have thoughts, but I wanna start with Sybil. How did you get in with this group? What was the draw? Yeah, I I think I was um, lamenting my ill fortune and uh, did not know how to progress in life. Uh, and uh, then heard about this rumor about uh, the Dread Fleet. Uh, and uh, hold on. Um, sorry. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so I heard about this rumor. So I need, I need coin. Uh, and, uh, this, this group seems like, like a, a, uh, you know, well, I don't know who else is going to be delving into dark dungeons and, and unearthing relics. So I figured why not? Of the three so far. Just based off what you know so far, Sybil, who are you most drawn to? Is it former dis disgraced noble rebel, uh, rock weirdo, or a guest, or uh, farmer slash <laughs> undertaker, or yeah, I, uh, I think I think I probably get along with with Revel. Like we have the same sort of. Uh, a little bit of mysticism going on, uh, you know, on similar similar backgrounds. Like, you know, maybe I was uh, 
adjacent to the nobility, not the ability of myself, but uh, in, in the, the rings, you know. Yeah, no, that's good. I like it. Um, good. So, like I said, it's kind of late in the afternoon. Everyone is, uh, I think you've brought a couple of donkeys um, just in case you need them, you know, just in case the, the rumor is true and you get to really clean up here, right? It's a fairly unremarkable journey, if I'm being honest. Um, you may not reach the cave system today before the before the night settles in, um, but you know, going around the table as a paint the scene question, which means I want everyone to say something. Just describe something that like emphasizes just how utterly uh, uneventful and unremarkable. <laughs> This journey has been so far, maybe even pleasantly uh, unremarkable, right? Whoever has a thought, say something. I think maybe Haru Guest is, is, you know, remembers the sort of abrasive presence of um, Myrna from um, the, you know, hated pretender from our journey to Broken Hearts and, um, and perhaps is, um, remarkably pleased by the silence of this journey um, without any quips or insults or anyone calling him rock weirdo to his face. Go for it, Orlin. Um, we have passed four other groups of travelers going in the opposite direction. And every time we spot them on the road, like, Orlin's eyes narrow and he grips his shovel a little tighter and, you know, he like narrows his gaze at them and we walk up and every single time, you know, whoever's at the front has been, hello travelers, and they just walk on by. Like none of them have been bandits or, you know, like sorcerers or people trying to sell us, you know, some sort of shoddy goods or something like that. It's all just been people who we passed on the road completely uneventfully. Everyone going about their business. Yeah. What do you think, Ruffle? Keep pushing the wrong button. Um, I think that like uh, like Orlin, Revel was is expecting conflict at every turn. And when it doesn't happen, he's almost disappointed at this point that it's it's going so boring. And uh, so he's drinking. Sybil, if you have any thoughts on how mundane this is, I'd love to hear them. Alternatively, I'll let you say, maybe how is this more exciting than your normal <laughs> life in Fort Turin? Yeah, uh, I think Sybil is, plays some instrument uh, and uh, there have been like cicadas, like the drone of cicadas just going on and on and on. And it sort of turns into you know, some sort of, uh, you know, at some points we th it sounds like they're harmonizing, you know, why would they, you know, why would they do that? I love it. As I mentioned earlier, you will get away from the road at some point and be in the full wilderness, um, mostly kind of patchy, scrubby woods, trying to find these, 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 these like sort of foothills where the cave system is supposed to be located. Uh, let's keep the paint the scene questions going a little bit longer. Do you find the wilderness to be pleasant or do you find the wilderness to be truly uh, miserable or even, I mean, that's too harsh. Do you find it to be pleasant or do you find it to be like inconvenient or annoying uh, and say why that's the case? I mean, I mostly find it amusing that the other three think of this as the wilderness. Um, and Orlin talks a lot about, like Orlin likes to go into um, how they haven't seen real wilderness, you know, until you've been, you know, uh, trying to climb the jagged peak during the height of, you know, uh, uh, the, winter, the winter solstice. Uh, that's real wilderness. This is, 
this is just you know walking to the back acre, um, and and Orlin is is um, not so much enjoying the journey, I think, but enjoying heckling them about their complaints about the journey. Um, Revel, generally pleasant or generally annoying? More pleasant than annoying. I think Revel coming from the Rose District is used to more open spaces and, and more fresh air than what uh, Fort Duran brings. So just getting out of that press and the smell of so much concentrated humanity is uh, refreshing. Yeah, what about you, Sybil? Pleasant or annoying? Uh, I think Sybil is enjoying the break from, from uh, you know, obviously there are there compatriots here but but you know the break from people in general the nobility and uh, has this rose tinted glasses for for outdoorsmanship and exploration you know seems like everyone's settling into the wilderness Orland. um horror guest annoying or, or pleasant i think horror guest has been entertaining himself by following this scarp of granite that's been rising and falling along the route like it's been like a journey with an old friend and he keeps saying ah there you are again my old friend so pleased to meet you and you know like following it along and sniffing it and doing and then accompanying that with his constant irritating litany of complaints and coughing and wheezing and bickering while simultaneously talking to the granite very good. The sun has set. The moon will be high in the sky. Are you going to press forward or are you going to make camp? I don't think we want to arrive there in the middle of the night, do we? Perhaps. Uh, Sybil, um, let, let me rephrase. I don't want to arrive there in the middle of the night. What what could go wrong? You, have you never been on a, a night hike? You know, we do this all the time. In Amberay, perhaps, where you can call for a guard. But out here, if we are beset by any of those uh, roaming bands that passed us on the road, we are on our own. Did we tell you about the ghost birds that shot beams from their eyes? <laughs> the, the what? That's what can go wrong. Can, can Hargus ask his new friends, the granite, and say, shush, shush, quiet you. I have a question to ask of my new friend. Uh, of the granite? <laughs> what, what do you ask? <laughs> Granite, is this a safe place to make camp, or do you know of any unpleasantness in your vicinity? The granite says yes, this is a safe place to make camp. <laughs> in whatever way the granite, whatever way the granite transmits such information. <laughs> Granite's known for being morally, you know, forthright, and so I, I believe the granite. Do you take it? at face value then. Well, cliff face value, you might call it, yes. He does this sort of thing, uh, Orland says to Sybil. You, you get used to it eventually. Uh... But uh, I can see over there that this campsite has uh, the thing that is required in all ideal campsites, which is the perfect location for a latrine uh, downwind of where we will be sleeping. That's the sort and of I, thing you need to know, right? And, and, and I hoist my shovel and start walking in that direction. <laughs> Sounds like camp is being made. <laughs> the decision has been made. Um, and with that, the set goal is accomplished. You've made camp for the night. You settle in, you build a fire, you are, you set a watch, you determine the watch order, all that business. Sybil, you've had maybe a day or two to get to know these folks 
And I'm curious of your assessment of them so far. Of your companions, your three new companions, one of them does something that you find um, incredibly irritating. And another one, maybe the same one, does something you find surprisingly endearing. Think about that for a moment. I'd like to know what it is or what those things are. And whilst, oh, are you ready, Sybil? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, perhaps uh, it's just Revel's uh, constant uh, tales of, of debauchery. You know, uh, these, these are rather tiring. They all sound the same after a while, you know, uh, and there's just, there's no, there's no novelty anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I find uh, Horagus talking with uh, nature quite uh, quite amusing, you know, and uh, it seems like there's been pertinent information gathered. So, and uh, this is particularly in intriguing for my, my, you know, to my magician self, so. Fantastic, thank you. You set your watch. Everyone, all four of you, will have a time to be on watch while the others sleep. I'll take volunteers first. Who falls asleep on their watch? <laughs> I think it's Hierogas because he stays up talking to the granite, like leaning against it, and then he starts falls asleep and starts sort of snoring uproariously. <laughs> Very good. You all wake up the next day, <laughs> um, just naturally, <laughs> um, and to your great surprise, you find that you are not in the forest anymore. Your campfire is there and it's dying embers are there. Your donkeys are there, they're hungry. And you're all there with all of your equipment and your sleeping packs and all that business, but you are not in the forest you are in what appears to be the grand foyer of a house of some sort. It is, well, how to describe it? There is a freshly swept carpet on the ground beneath your campfire. The walls are decorated with bright, colorful tapestries. There are huge brass candelabras uh, lining a grand doorway behind you. The candelabras seem recently polished and they have candles in them. You can see there is a set of double doors behind you. There is a single door in front of you. The ceiling of this foyer is very arched and tall, probably like 20, 30 feet high. And there are windows looking to the outside as well. Let's just have this moment as you're all getting up from your rest. Uh, horror guest, what happened? Well, I talked to my friend and he said everything was fine, but I'm starting to think that the granite is dishonest. No horror guest, and I kind of walk up to him and I just like gently gather the folds of his, you know, whatever cloak or, or, or tunic he's wearing into my hands. And I get close to him and I say, you were on watch, Horagest, so you saw what happened. T 
tell me exactly what happened, Horagest. Well, you know, memory's a fallible thing. Who's to say what happened? Hmm. Revel, what do you do? First, he, uh, he'll look at his bottle of wine and just take a sniff, see that it, it doesn't smell like it's been tampered with. And then, uh, any of those candelabras uh, able to be lifted? No, they're quite, well, they're, they can be lifted, but they can't be carried around. They're too big. They're like floor, you know, size. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah he'll walk up to, to one and kind of rub his thumb along it and, and turn back and say, feels like home. <laughs> Oh, did the swirling court do this to us? Is this Those your fault? Seem like their type of thing. Sybil, what do you do? Yeah, uh, I look around. Are there any like crests, like family shields or anything like that? Yeah, uh, give me, I did mention there were tapestries. So do a hunt roll. So, um, uh, Mike, we use a die roller in the trophy discord. If you want to go check that out. Um, it's a, there's a little dice section. Yep, I see it. And you'll uh, just type in forward slash hunt. Uh, well, depending on how many dice you're doing, you get one die just for doing it or for asking the question. And then you get another die if you have a relevant skill or a piece of equipment that would be relevant. Mm. Don't think any of my skills apply. Uh, it would be a stretch. So, so if you're just eyeballing it to a hunt one, so forward slash hunt one. Okay, there you go. Uh, yeah. A six light is a uh, token. So go ahead and note a hunt roll token on your character sheet. And I'll tell you what you see. There is a family crest on one of the tapestries. It's quite prominent. Uh, none of you recognize it. Even Revel, who at least who has a connection to this world, and even you, Sybil, have a connection to this world to some degree. Uh, you do not recognize this family crest. It just does not uh, look like anything you've seen. It, in very stylized letters, spells out the word Amber. And it features um, like kind of a, a wild cat chasing a wolf, which is chasing uh, another wild cat and then another wolf. Like they're kind of going in a circle around this sort of stylized word Amber. But you don't know any Amber, House Amber, and uh, you've certainly never seen the crest. Orlin, what do you do? So, uh, you know, I've kind of let Horogast go. And um, I'm going to, uh, like, I want out of this room. So I'm going to go look for, for, for doors, for passageways, for stairs, whatever, like. There is a door that goes deeper into the house. Mm -hmm. And there's a door that goes outside. Okay, I will throw open those doors that go outside and take a look and see, you know, like um, when I, you know, I'm mostly curious, like when I throw them open, is it going to be the landscape that we saw before and this house is kind of just dropped on top of us or are we somewhere <laughs> else entirely? Make a hunt roll. Yeah, you bet. Um, and uh, I am going to uh, make the case that uh, by identifying plants is one of the ways that I can uh, determine if we are in the same place or not. I'll look for whether, you know, is that scraggly little tree still there or is it completely different? And that's the thing oh, that will good. catch my eye first. So we've got one, two. Uh, got a three. There's something terrible. You encounter something terrible. Um, you can't make any sense of whether this landscape is familiar or not because the whole area 
have is covered in this very thick rolling gray mist. And it's very, very thick and it goes well above the treetops. It, uh, it doesn't go overhead, but it's like a big wall, you know, in front of you. And you can only see, I mean, you can basically only see just a few feet from the steps leading up to the entrance to the house. You will notice though, as you poke your head out, that it's much more than a house. This is a huge, huge uh, sprawling castle just from like poking your head around, right? Sure. But there's this mist that sort of just hangs just a couple feet from it. Oh, is this like a weird thing where I can see all along the wall and maybe up, but the mist is like sort of, but, but if I try to look out any further, that's where the mist is? Or, yeah, like the, or the just, mist is like, the mist is like, it's away from the house, but only a yeah. few feet. Yeah, Got so it. it's like okay. a barrier. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I'm going to follow up with you though. What do you do then once you see this? Uh, I sigh and I turn and I say, I have no way of telling how far we have gone, my friends, or indeed whether we are still in the world that we, well, that we know. Um, I fear we will have to try and find answers from whoever lives here. Horagus, what do you do? I think Horagus has been looking at his hand, which he's painted with the paints he got from the Swirling Court to disguise it. So it looks more or less like a normal hand, but actually it's now made of some jade. But it's partially enmeshed in the green dimension of Swirling Court magic. So it's sort of slightly anchored in another world. So I think what I'm going to do is get my forefinger, touch the ground and try and attune to figure out if I can figure out if this is another dimension, are we in some kind of fey world, like the green dimension, or where are we, you know, dimen planes, you know, like in that sense. I love it. Uh, do a hunt roll. Okay, let's give this a go. Oh, that's, yeah, that's wonderful. I got a two. <laughs> Describe what you're doing again. So I'm, I've got my my forefinger of my my green hand, and I've touched the ground of the hall, and I'm just sort of trying to use my attunement to sort of resonate and see if I can get a sense of this structure and what where and what it is. I will tell you that the marble that was used to make the floor of this room. came from another world. How do you know that? The veins in the marble are not the banding or the color you would expect from any normal terrestrial marble. There's like veins of starlight and purple and things, little flashes of things that are not, not of this world. Yeah, that's great. Well, Let's circle back to Revel. Revel, you've got a lot of information here. The hall is otherwise empty. The only thing really in it, apart from those candlesticks and tapestries on the walls, is are your donkeys and your <laughs> and your camp equipment. Uh, and then there's doors going deeper into the or a door going deeper into the house. Well, whoever lives here either is okay with us setting up camp or has yet to find us. And if it's the latter, we should probably get out of here before they discover the campfire we've built on their fine carpet. And he'll start walking towards that other single door and press his ear against it, I think. Hmm, yeah. That's good. Do a hunt roll. Skill in homes help at all? It feels like a bit of a stretch. Um, uh, just do one die while you're doing just listening. Unless you have something to stick with. I don't know how terrible this is, but it's what you discover in any case. You hear on the other side of the door the distinct sound of someone yelling at someone else saying, Keep your fists up, keep your fists up. That's good, that's good. Now, 
jab, jab, jab with your right hand. Left hook, left hook. Good, good, good. Keep moving, keep moving, keep your feet moving. That's it, that's it. We'll make a boxer out of you yet. What do you do? He'll turn around to the others and say, sounds like a, a combat lesson on the other side. Perhaps we want to surprise them. I suspect that nothing in this building is actually what it looks like. This floor is definitely not what it looks like. I have a feeling whatever's going on in that room, it's not a boxing lesson. It sounded pretty clearly like a boxing lesson. He said the word boxer. And uh, he'll just slowly turn the knob and try and make an opening he can peek through. Before you go in, Orlin, are you still outside? Or have you still stepped up? On, are you still on the like little stoop? Or have you cut, shut the doors and come back in? Uh, I have shut the doors and come back in. Yeah, to, to you know, like, like I'm not, whatever, whatever properties that fog has, I prefer that they stay outside. So <laughs> okay. Everyone knows sealed, fog, fog is always bad. <laughs> exactly. I've sealed the doors and, and wandered back in, you know, with that. And, and I think I, I was doing that as I was saying, we need to find who lives here. Yeah. Uh, Sybil, what are you up to right now? Just before we swing open this interior door. Well, I suppose when I was looking around, did I see any, like, you know, ring a bell for a porter, you know, or or any, like, the welcoming party? Where's the welcoming party? No, nothing like that. Okay. Um, then, yeah, I'm, I'm readying my uh, sling uh, as, as you know, in preparation for the store opening. Indeed, indeed. I'm going to put us on a break slightly early because I have to pull together an image board. But uh, when we get back, uh, we shall begin the next set. So let's take five. I would like to go ahead and share with you an image board. Now, this map does have a couple of um, secret doors on it <laughs> that your characters wouldn't know about, but it's just a couple, and I don't think it's going to have any effect on how you search the dungeon. So, but if we go take a look at that. Also, these images came from the original book, and so they. They're meant to be, they're not meant to be, they're from two on two different pages and they don't quite like line up properly. <laughs> and so they look a little off skew. They look a little like off skew, that's why. It's good enough though for our purposes. You are over in the lower left corner as we're as we're looking at it. Um, and those doors there open up. And there is a hallway there. And it's a narrow hallway with like a really deep, like amber colored velvet rug runner going down the length of it. And the sounds of boxing is coming from uh, from, from the right-hand side, there's a door there, probably coming from whatever room is in there. And then there's another set of uh, double doors at the end of the hallway. Each of these squares is 10 feet. So these are a pretty good sized place, right? Ravel, you went first, what do you do? And the sound of the boxing is louder now. Is the door into the, the room with the boxing uh, open or closed? Uh, it is closed. Uh, do you check it? I think he'll move past it, actually, and uh, walk to the other 
double doors and see if uh, any activity immediately on the other side. They don't want to get caught between two groups. Yeah. So, so you go to the double doors at the end of the hall, then what, what do you do? Press the ear against it once more. <laughs> uh, take a hunt roll. Five. Take your token. On the other side of the door, you hear a woman's voice. She is also on the other side of the door. And she says, I can hear you. What's your name? He'll look over at the others and, and clear his throat and, and say, Virian. Virian. I don't know a Virian. I'm Isabel. Pleasure to meet you, Isabel. Well, I hope we get to speak again soon, Virian. I have to go now. Uh, yes, of, of course. I hope so as well. And he'll start turning the door handle. I'm going to check in with everyone else before we go any further. Uh, Sybil, what are you up to? Uh, can we... I know we're hearing one, at least one side of this exchange. Can we hear the, the voice? You can, uh, no, not, not unless you're pressed up close to it like, <laughs> like Rebel is. But you can you can hear Revel talking back to someone though. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll, I'll whisper like, "Who is that?" She says her name's Isabel. Oh, can, does she know anything about this place? She didn't have much to say. All right, let's uh, go, go on then. <laughs> uh, horror guest, what are you doing? Horror guest is firstly, d dislikes the amber color of the, the carpet because amber is, is a fraud of the lapidary world given it's not actually a stone, but it stone. tends to be a stone. So he's not a big fan of amber because he can't do anything with it. Um, but he's just thinking that all of these voices are actually, you know, if the floor is not real, maybe none of this is real. Maybe, maybe the curse has finally started crystallizing his brain and this is all some elaborate hallucination. So I think he's just like listening through the door of the boxing room thinking, is that really boxing? Or is this some kind of inner turmoil manifested externally? I'm not gonna make you roll because I've already kind of said what's there, but you just hear them, uh, you hear, the trainer, whoever it is, say, that's good, that's good. Let's take a break. And he's like, I could use, I could use a bit of a, a bit of a libation. Celebrate your progress. You're doing wonderful, just wonderful. That's what you hear. I think I'll turn back to the others and say, I'm not sure I want to find out who any of these people are. Orlin, what do you do? I um, <clears throat> sigh exasperatedly at horror guest and say, well, it seems the circumstances prevent any other possible outcome than getting to know these people or at least trying to figure out why they brought us here. Uh, and I will um, uh, throw open that door uh, into where we heard the people talking about boxing. And I say, libations, you say, perhaps we can help you. What you see inside, well, first of all, Orlin, are you going through the other door? Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, or, I'm, I'm sorry, Revel, oh, I'm sorry. sorry, Revel, are you going through the other door? 
Uh, when Orlin throws in, uh, open the, the boxing room door, no, he will stop what he's doing. Okay. So in this space, you open it up to see a room that is luxuriously furnished with, oh, and also we have a set goal too. So the west wing of the house, now that you're kind of fully in it, the west wing of the house has a set goal. Find a silver key. So the room is luxuriously furnished with plush chairs, polished wood tables, ornate rugs and other fine furniture. The furniture has been kind of pushed back against the walls and the carpets have been rolled up and in the middle of the floor, an impromptu boxing ring has been set up. In one corner of the ring, a man stands as still as a statue with his hands raised in the sort of a guard position. He is wearing uh, silk boxing trunks, uh, amber colored, of course, and his skin has a let's say an unnatural quality to it. It's sort of milky white uh, and slightly translucent. Seated near the boxer is a man dressed in colorful silks, fancy lace and rich velvets. Uh, he has a large brimmed hat flaunting a peacock's feather and a jeweled rapier is kind of slung on his right side. He has wavy black hair, closely trimmed beard, which comes to a point. And then there are two other men in plate mail carrying halberds standing on uh, either side of the richly dressed man. And these two men, these like guards, they also have this sort of weird, like kind of milky white, slightly translucent skin as the boxer does. The chairs have all been pushed back, as I mentioned, but they are facing the boxing ring. <laughs> Floating above each chair is a pair of red, unblinking eyes. These red, unblinking eyes floating above each chair turn to look at you, Orlin, as you announce yourself. And the whole group eventually turns. And the man dressed in fancy silks, he gets up from his little stool in the ring and he says, oh, what good timing. Come in, come in. And I, I do, I step forward. Greetings, sir. Are you uh, one of the residents of this place? We find ourselves here quite unexpectedly. I am indeed. I am John Lewis Amber. It's very nice to meet you. Uh, how shall I call you? My name is Orlin, sir. Orlin. What an interesting name. That's, you must not be from around here. Mm, that I fear is part of our dilemma. We presume that we are not from around here, but we do not know what around here uh, actually entails. Well, you've arrived at a really terrible time. Um, you're not going to be able to leave. Uh, the mist will prevent that, I'm afraid. So mm, you're just I stuck with us, much. I'm afraid. Well, uh, that being the case, allow me to introduce you to my traveling companions, I say, you know, making an expansive gesture behind Come me. in, come in, all of you, please. Uh, and I kind of, are, are, are there any seats that don't have the eyes floating above them? Sure, yeah. Okay, and so, so then I will kind of uh, uh, sort of indicate some of those seats that are unoccupied um, uh, uh, to my friends. Uh, and, 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 you know, kind of like make a gesture that indicates they should each introduce themselves. Please do. My name is Haragust. I am a geomancer and I believe that I am having a nightmare and or an hallucination. <laughs> well, you are definitely in the right place then, friend. Castle Amber is a horror. A horror of boredom. Um, well, I at least do my best to try to keep everyone's spirits up. Uh, and you, uh, to Sybil, how shall I call you? You, call, you know, 
uh, Sybil, you know, of the of the Grey Plains, and uh, I don't know that. Yes, <laughs> and uh, you know, I am a magician and dancer and oh. entertainer. Uh, so perhaps I can be of help. And you, sir. Revel will kind of stand up a little straighter and approach and, and say, my name is Virian Revel Wathorn of the Rose District. Thank you for allowing my entourage to join you today. Not all of those words have any meaning to me, friend. Only some of them do, but you are nevertheless welcome. Uh, in fact, I'm rather glad you're here. You see, I've been training this fellow here uh, to, to fit in fisticuffs, but uh, don't don't yet have a uh, don't yet have uh, someone for him to for him to box. And well, my audience, I think they are getting a little. Uh, stir crazy. They're ready for some. They're ready for some action. If one of you would like to meet my man in the ring, uh, well, I'll make it worth your trouble. Worth our trouble exactly? How? Well, I've got one fine fat sack of silver. If you can last four rounds with him, and I'll double it if you can beat him. Hmm. Uh, I, I, and I, I say a moment with my companions, if you would, please. Indeed. And I, all know, the glowing I, red I, eyes are very focused on you all. Right? And I, you know, and I'm going to do that thing where I like pull everybody into a huddle kind of, right. And I'm, well, what, what do you think? I mean, this seems like, I mean, he's, he looks, I mean, he's certainly large, but he doesn't look terribly intelligent. Revel in your debauchery is brawling the sort of thing that you engaged in. Uh, surely you know all sorts of dirty tricks that you might be able to bring to bear here. I suspect dirty tricks are, are not the tool we should be grasping for here. And we'll turn to Sybil. You're a dancer. That's almost like boxing. Well. I suppose, but uh, I'll, I'll look at the. Um, I could think of no better way for you to prove yourself to us that indeed you belong in the group here, than to uh, step forward bravely in our hour of need. Yeah, I think I think Civil thinks on this for a while and says, like, "Well, I only have to last for four rounds." Indeed. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think perhaps that there's there there might be advantages that we could convey. I see. And uh, I all right. I I like this plan. And uh, maybe we can. Uh, although, how? What are we going to do? You, you said we can't leave. Hmm. Well, we can't leave now. Presumably, this mist won't be here forever. If it is, then perhaps we can avail ourselves of, if there are delights to be had here, then we should find our way to them. There is a door on the other side of the room going presumably into another part of the West Wing. And if indeed others are trapped here, then a fat sack of silver might help us in our negotiations with them. It's all right, but uh, I I will carry it. You know, it'll it'll be my my burden. Oh, but if 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 it is your fists that win it for us, then it is your fist. We shall uh, put it into my friend. Well, I don't know about winning, but uh, surviving uh, that I might be able to do. John Lewis Amber says. So, what shall it be? Do we have a match, or do we have a match? Uh, and I grab Sybil's arm and I hold it up. And I say, Sybil shall be our champion, sir. Ah, very good, very good. Well, then let me make the announcements. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, he says to the assembled crowd of glowing red eyes floating above chairs. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, cousins, fellow Ambers, 
I have a match for you today between my man here, a magical construct who I have not yet given a name, but he is a fearsome fighter and very capable, I'm sure. And Sybil of a place I don't quite know. The high plane, you said, the gray plane. The gray plains. The gray plains. Come. And so. And but but before they haul Sybil away, I kind of turn and I, I look at Sybil and I say, um, and I have a little packet. Um, uh, and I say, um, uh, should you find yourself reeling, take these herbs and they will numb any pain from his blows. <laughs> and I'm gonna knock off the use of my numbing herbs that I carry around with me as one of my items to pass it to Sybil to use when it might be helpful to them. Nice. Uh, in this context, I like it. I think I will have it, I'll let it count as like a piece of armor, Sybil. Uh, but just for this encounter. All right. It's going to be a combat, though. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. <laughs> so it's the two, two of you. Um, uh, it's, it's bare fisticuffs. Um, and this unnamed, described as a magical construct man, uh, sort of stomps into the middle of the thing, rock'em, sock'em, robot stiffness. And... Um, you can see now as you get closer, like you can look underneath his skin on his torso and see like his organs and stuff, like as you kind of get closer to him. And John, John Lewis says, all right then, this, this is very exciting. We have, not, we have not actually had a fight yet. And trust me, everyone was a little put out by me moving around the furniture. So this is, this is good. Fight. Um, how are you vulnerable, Sybil? Uh, I think, yeah. I like obviously I can, I can dodge and and weave and duck, you know. But if I get hit, it's not going to be good. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, all right, sounds good. Let's have a weak roll on the die roller, just forward slash weak. Okay, your weak point's four. Uh, you need an eight to defeat him outright. Uh, otherwise, you just have to go four rounds. So uh, first round is a combat one. Uh, you obviously can't win the first round, but he might get a hit on you. So roll combat one. Okay, and uh, do skills apply? Or? Nope, no, combat's okay. just straight die rolls. Okay, so just narrate the first part of the fight. How does it go? Uh, so this is a, a not good result. Uh, it just oh, basically just means nothing happened. Like it's just a draw. Okay. Like you didn't okay. hit him. He didn't hit you. Or at least not uh, enough to hurt each other. Sure. Then I I think I'm, you know, playing temperance perhaps, and uh, you know, move moving quickly, but not as quickly as I can, and uh, just dodging these hits and, and expecting it. And uh, I'm not I'm not trying to get a hit in at all. I'm just feeling out the, uh, what's going on. Nice, this goes on for a bit. Um, each of you kind of, you know, uh, sussing each other up, maybe getting a few punches in, a few dodges, and the round ends. Um, John Lewis says, ding, 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 the round is over. <clears throat> round two, now you're gonna roll two dice. Combat two, looking for eight. Hey, you got it. And he did not hit you either. You're going to get a clean knockout here. Describe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think this is presumably a boxing match, but Sybil doesn't know anything about boxing. Um, so I get in there and use the construct's momentum, you know, and uh, it goes to punch, and I, I like trip it, and uh, it, it goes sprawling you know maybe it smashes itself nice and um and i think it just doesn't get up <laughs> it's like it's just like on the ground 
like moving around like a beetle on its back. <laughs> and uh, John Lewis says, he's counting. And, and in between each count, he's like, one, we didn't really talk about getting up. Two, he hasn't taken much of a hit yet. Three, but this is good, valuable data for future boxing endeavors. Four, and he goes on like this for some time. I really hope he gets up because I really don't want to give away this money. Five, and so on, until he gets to 10. And he's like, well, that's, that's it then. Yes, ding, 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 fabulous. Uh, it says, well, as promised, when he does get you two sacks of silver, it's worth two gold in our game terms. Uh, just put two gold on your, uh, your character keeper. There's a little gold section there. Got it. And horror guess, what are you up to right now? While well, this is kind of going on. I was betting, uh, I, I, I'm going to say I was going to bet against him, but I um, <laughs> instead I got distracted by trying to figure out what the constructs are made of. So now, now it's like on its back, you know, squirming around and sort of prodding it and saying, what are you, my friend? Are you, are you organic or are you a mechanical creature? Show me your secrets. And I just start prodding. Take the, roll. The, the, yeah. Take um, do you, do you think, um, I, I don't actually think, I think it might be a one dice one because I'm really not doing anything like logical. Or... <laughs> it's, one dice is fine <laughs> if you're okay with that. I think this is more intemperance than, oh yes, I got a one. Uh, if you had any tokens, they're gone. I didn't. Oh, lucky you. You encounter something terrible, we will come back to that. Revel, what are you doing? Uh, um, I think Revel is... Can he, like, lean over and, and try and, like, feel the space where the eyes are occupying? Maybe get a sense or a ritual in use or... Any kind of uh, magic? Yeah, make a hot roll. After the fight, though, I should tell you that the eyes are gradually fading away. Uh, would that be two with the skills and ritual? Uh, yeah, I'm into it. Go for it. Yeah. A four. Take your token. I think you'll be able to suss out that the, the ambers are watching from different parts of the house. They're all capable of doing like a remote viewing thing. <laughs> um, and uh, you, you, you sense this. How do you know it though? Like, is there something that kind of gives it away? I can feel like the, the tether of magic floating off into other spaces. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, good. You encounter something terrible. It's kind of terrible on its own because it means the ambers can watch you, right? Um, Orlin, at the end here, what are you doing? Um, uh, I, I, um, I have, I have appointed myself Sybil's corner man, you know, and so like, you know, like held the ropes open for them when they went in and, you know, was like hollering advice at them as they were ducking and weaving in between rounds. I say, you know, I, I say, uh, he's slower to the left than to the right you know, watch out for that, you know, um, and, uh, you know, as soon as uh, he says 10, you know, I leap through the ring, I hold Sybil's arm up, I kind of, you know, like, like triumphantly pump my fist in the air, well done, well done, my friend, you know, like, like, like slapping them on the back, um, uh, and I say um, to, uh, to the noble there, um, surely this is, what's that? John Lewis Amber. John Lewis, yes, John Lewis Amber. I say to him, surely this is not the only room uh, uh, to which you have access, sir. Perhaps, perhaps we could go somewhere else, somewhere more conducive to uh, festivities and share a celebratory drink with you. He's like, oh, well, uh, I, I probably don't have the time, but, and I'm not in, particularly invested in uh, celebrating being two sacks of silver coin poorer. But I will say this, there are, um, there is a feast being held um, 
here in the West Wing in the Feasting Hall. You are welcome to, to join it and to have your own personal celebration. Wonderful. Shall, um, is a, some sort of formal invitation required? Shall we simply mention your name? Oh, just walk in and find a seat. Ah, they might even be expecting you. Ah, yes, well, we shall do that. Thank you for an entertainment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your silver. Perhaps if we come back this way, we will offer you the opportunity to win it back from us. Yes, perhaps. By then, I shall have perfected his technique. Maybe. I really doubt it. These things are ho totally hopeless. Speaking of which, horror guest, you're there poking and prodding this. It's flesh. You can see organs and bones. You can also see pressing forward out of the side, pressing up through the skin a face and it's mouthing something, but it, you can't tell because there's flesh over it. It's just like, <laughs> what do you do? I look at it and say, this is definitely a nightmare. I don't like it. And I just turn around and go back to all and say, this place is very strange and I don't like it. Uh, yes. Uh, I agree, and neither do I, but we find ourselves stuck here. So I suppose the first step is to learn the rules, don't you think? Has the stone told you anything? Well, I know that the floor in the other room is from another dimensional world entirely, and nothing I've seen in this room has disabused me of the notion that we are somewhere very strange. Hmm. Well, we got here somehow, so... Presumably, there's some sort of way for us to return home. Well, with all this said, Sybil, anything you want to do at the end here or ready to move on? Uh, so, yeah, I was well, wondering, um, is the construct, does it seem like its, it's flesh is similar to the other amberites? Um, no, or, no, they, they, look different? Like, they look like regular people. Um, mm -hmm. The construct looks like very different. It's like pale, milky, translucent. Only if you're close to it, translucent. Skin. Okay. Okay. So there is a door. Uh, there are two doors out of here, and the door, or no, I'm sorry, just the one door. There's one door out of here. And, or you could go back the way you came to the hallway. Um, Rebel, what do you think? First thing Revel is going to do is report back that the eyes are connected to people in the house and uh, that we need to be careful. And then, uh, yeah, I think I'll go for that double door that Isabel was behind. Huh? What about everybody else? Are you all following Revel or going some routes? You can split up. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you? <laughs> 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 no, I think I think uh, uh, um, uh, I, I certainly am going to trust in rebels uh, in rebels uh, fair features and uh, a long experience with debauchery mm. to uh, guide us uh, in dealing with this uh, you know person on the other side of the door. Fair enough, uh, Horgus Sybil, you following rebel? I think I'll follow rebel, and then as as Sybil walks past, I'll say. You know, you could be a contender one day. I've got some old people in the village who'd be very interested in fighting you. Be good training. So well, I don't I don't do much fighting. I just uh I just get out of the way and they, they the ground fights them, you know. <laughs> I like that. The ground is a very good and graceful fighter. The hallway is as you found it before a rebel, and we have these double doors that Isabel was previously behind. Um, when you open them up, and they do just open right up, you see ah, you have entered a hall of mirrors, a wide, long hallway running east to west. 
or in this case, west to east. In the center of the hall, there is uh, the carpets change. There's a 10 foot wide red carpet stretching from uh, down, down the way. The ceilings arch 20 feet overhead. Near the east end of the hall, you can see like a raised catwalk stretching across it. And at either end um, of that little catwalk overpass, there are sets of doors. Thousands, the most intriguing feature of this room <laughs> is that thousands of one inch square mirrors are set into the ceiling and walls. It's just covered in thousands of little tiny mirrors. The resulting reflection of whatever light sources you may have um, resembles a swarm of fireflies as myriad pinpoints of light are sort of reflected back. And the floor of the hall where it's not covered with red carpet is polished with a very like fine white marble or a, has a white marble, very highly polished. It's so shiny, you can actually see your reflection. And there are, again, these tall brass candelabras lining both walls, crystal chandeliers hanging from the ceilings. The candles are all presently unlit. I do need a light source uh, to get a good sense of this place. Um, so if anybody has like a lantern or maybe a horror guest little, if you have any glowing stones or whatever, um, there's no, there's not much natural light in this hall. My hand glows now because it's it's sort of a geode because I so I'll just like put my right hand up and it'll sort of glow green. Yeah, so you'll get a good, you know, pretty good view of everything I've described. Um, uh, and, and of course, it's like the lights being just reflected like crazy over all these mirrors, right? It's a very dazzling effect. And so I'm curious what uh, is everybody going inside? Everybody goes inside. And as soon as you're all in this great mirrored hall, all of the doors in this hall, and there are a fair number of them, including the ones that you just stepped out of. All of the door doors suddenly swing open all at once and then slam shut. And as soon as they slam shut, every light source extinguishes, including your glowing hand, Horagest. It just becomes perfectly dark inside the hall. Revel, what do you do? He'll slowly take his dagger out from the little sheath on his thigh and uh, just have that ready. And then you hear a voice. Him. It's Isabel's voice. She says, and you can't really tell exactly where it's coming from. It's sort of just all around you. She says, I think the dark is better, don't you? It's easier when it's dark, less things to distract you, easier to keep focused, easier to keep your mind clear. What do we need such focus for? Well, it's easier to hunt in the dark. I'm afraid to ask what you're hunting, Isabel. Oh, I think you know what I'm hunting. Don't think any of my rituals here would be very helpful. Uh, 
I'm thinking brimstone for me. I think I might wait until Isabel tries to grab us and then I'm going to glow incandescently hot and try and burn away some of the darkness. She says, perhaps one of you could light a candle or a lantern, even a torch. And then you hear over your shoulder, Orlin, you feel icy cold fingers touching the back of your neck. Perhaps you could light a candle. Um, so yeah, so, so there's fingers touching my neck. Just lightly. Yes, yeah, sure. lightly, all right, cool. Um, uh, so um, yeah, this is where then I just spin around and throw myself at it and try and tackle it. There's nothing there. You just, okay. yeah, you just, you, you, know, just whatever. Stum- I, you just stumble I, in the dark. Sure, yeah. I flail at it and I say, I don't have a candle. These games are tiresome. Are you an amber, Isabel? In the dark, the rest of your family can't see whatever game it is you're playing here. Sybil, you hear in your ear, I am Isabel Amber. I'll let you decide which one of your friends will die first. Uh, and I think I will hold up my my mirror, you know, and point it at the sound. So oh, there's your answer. Ah, this is fun. Make a hunt roll with two dice. Good day four. Take your token. It's not total darkness. There's still wisps of ambient light, but coming from various places, but it's, you can't see much, but you do see just a very wide toothy grin in your little mirror. And then it recedes into the darkness. Isabel whispers in your ear, Horacast. What happened to you? I spent too long interfering with things that weren't my business, just like you do, Isabel. And uh, something a little bit like this happened, and then I'm going to cast Brimstone like I've been <laughs> scratching it on the floor slowly on the carpet, and I'm going to just go. Very good. I love it. Um, what are you hoping to accomplish? I'm hoping to glow incandescently hot and burn Isabel and burn off this magically induced darkness. Uh, yeah, I'm here for it. Um, let's talk about what could go wrong. Drew, Jim, Mike, any thoughts on what could go wrong here if the die roll fails? Uh, he could catch the carpet on fire. That would be bad. Yeah. I think you might you're probably probably this might be happening anyway but like you might be kind of falling into her trap of please let a please let a torch or a candle <laughs> so. that's it's uh, too bright or... go on go on it's too bright and we're all momentarily just just blinded yeah 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 uh I I think similar to to yours uh, in that uh, you need light for a shadow to appear. You know, so mm, yeah, the light actually helps, right? Like she she wants the light, right? She clearly is trying to goad you into this. Good. Um, um, yeah, I, I think I might pick setting fire to the carpet for mine. Oh, this is just talking about what could go wrong. It's not devil's bargain. Oh, we're yet. talking. We're not. We're not devil's bargain. Yeah, yet. these are just, we're just spitballing ill fates. Um, let's talk about your dice. Uh, you get a light die if you have a relevant skill, piece of equipment, or if you're using the environment in some way. Well, I have I have rituals and I have the ritual brimstone. So. I love it. So you've got one light die there. And now Devil's Barkins, uh, something that will happen no matter what, whether this is a success or a failure, this thing will happen. Make your offers.
I mean, I think the 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 kind of turning molten will melt a little bit of that marble and it will get mixed with you. And so you'll leave here with a little bit of that extra dimensional stone mixed with your stone body, regardless of whether this works or not. I'm gonna say no matter what, the, the light that you create creates a dazzling effect. Well, no, I don't know if it's, it would be bright enough. Even like it was just you burning really hot. I don't know if that'd be like enough light, but in any case, um, my offer is going to be, mm, no matter what, she's still a problem. Either she, either if you deal with her right now or she gets away and you have to deal with her later. Any other options? Because we're not in, because we're not in the world that we're used to, uh, brimstone doesn't do what it, what we associate with brimstone and maybe it has, uh, it changes in effect from here on out. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, introducing light to this hallway is, is some sort of social faux pas in, in this castle, uh, and it will, will regret it later. The embers will be pissed about it, yeah. <laughs> That's a lot of choice. A lot of varied choices for you here, James. What do you think? I think I like the idea of it being a social faux pas. <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay, so you got two light dice, and you're gonna do a dark die for the ritual. So risk two one. Okay. Five, five on light dice. Uh, the complication is going to be that your incandescence is enough to trigger a trap that she has been trying to set and that trap will go off. If you don't want that trap to go off, you otherwise get her off your case. But if you don't want that trap to go off, you can add a dark die, roll again, try to get a six. Oh, why not? What could possibly possibly go wrong with doing that? I'll, I'll do it. That's even worse. That's, that's a terrible result. <laughs> that's a fail. Um, <laughs> is, would somebody like to uh, narrate help here? Maybe a help die could be handy. Um, Rebel will, will help. Can you, since Mike is new, can you remind us mechanically how that works? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so the help dice, um, the way the help roll works is if you are, if, if someone's doing a risk roll and you want to help them, you describe how you're helping. You can only help if the original die roll has a dark die in it. This one does. Uh, your die, you roll a light die. It just, it just counts as part of the roll. But if your light die matches one of the dark dies, then you take a ruin. What do you think, uh, Revel? You kind of step up to the plate. Revel will help. Yeah, how so? He'll uh, kind of crouch down to the the markings that Horgust had drawn on the floor and put his finger on it and start channeling his own magic into it to power it up a bit. Okay, love that. Go ahead and roll a light die. Or just roll weak on the die roll. Five. Back to the original result. <laughs> um, back to the original result. It does open up the possibility of adding another dark die again. So uh, if you want to do that, you can. Uh, Horror guest. I'm going to do it just for mechanical novelty because I've never done that before. You're rolling two light, three dark. Oh, well, that was a stylish way of getting a six. I got two, two sixes, both sixes. on the dark. Uh, yeah, so you got a six, your ruin's going up, but you uh, you get her away and you don't trigger whatever trap she had in mind. So uh, just describe what this looks like, like what happens. So I think um, 
yeah, Harrogas feels the energy channeled by Revel and his runes kind of flare up and he sort of bursts brightly, in, you know, into, you know, this sort of incandescent whiteness and the the darkness all pushes back for a second. Um, and he has and he has this feeling that, yeah, like he's committed a faux pas. He's kind of done one of his like antisocial sort of interventions again without asking anyone's permission, the magical faux pas. But he can feel the green creeping up his arm again, that he's expended more of his magical energy and that his arm is feeling stiff and leaden or like stone-like and he thinks the curse has progressed again. I'm going to suggest that the faux pas, just to be real like kind of clear about what happened here, this out of character knowledge, but I think we're going to say what it is, is like, so the Ambers are all, they're all sorcerers and magicians of various sorts. And I think the faux pas is you using magic in Castle Amber without kind of getting someone's permission, right? Um, and so it is a, but you, but you hear Isabel kind of like cry out, uh, and you can hear her kind of scampering away. And as she sort of runs away in the darkness, well, it's a little bit light now, but she just says something like, I was just playing a prank on you. No need to be so uh, violent. And you don't hear from her anymore, or at least not at the moment. Maybe not forever. Once your incandescence, oh, sorry. Sorry. once your incandescence sort of slowly dies down, though, you are back in this dark hall, <laughs> like everyone. So what are you doing? <laughs> my, my arm glows again, but now it's quite obvious that more of my arm is glowing than was before, all the way up to my, above my arm, above my elbow. Yeah. All in the fading light of horror guest is maybe not enough to navigate by. What do you do? So um, this is, I, I, I may be being too much of a, 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 a munchkin here, but on the map, there is actually a window at the end of that hall. Right. It, is it like covered by thick curtains or yes. something like that? Or, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, so, so then if you want to, if you want to find I'm going to go outside you know, facing wall. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like haul that curtain open to try and get some of that outside light into the hall just to light it up. You can. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a curtain there. You can haul that, you can pull that curtain aside. And uh, and yeah, that, that, that light comes in. It's very dazzling. Um, it it's it's kind of back to what was, as i described except even more so like it's just a very dazzling you know like kind of space uh you can see the candelabras with unlit candles there are the doors various places there's a little catwalk up above Sybil, what do you do and also when you look out the window you can see that mist <laughs> um it doesn't let in a ton of light but it lets in enough yeah uh i think i will carefully walk the hall and uh listen for like which one of these is the feast room you know yeah um okay so you're heading down let's just go around the table uh revel what are you doing i just want to double check should revels uh ruin go up because of the dark five in the role oh because was there an eventual five in the dark in the dark dice um because he helped and oh and it does yeah. have a, oh it does have a five yeah it will go up yeah um i would say it's just probably like drained just Matt, you're just kind of probably drained a little bit from from the magic but um yeah but what are you doing now he'll kind of uh rise slowly a little a little more uh winded than he expected to be and do we get a sense for what direction isabel headed off in um kind of uh i mean just down the hall generally i guess but yeah. 
And is there a way up to the catwalk that we can see, or is it no? No, that's not from here. Wall. Okay. Yeah, you do, however, see if you um, you'll notice people occasionally walking across the catwalk, going back and forth. I don't like how exposed we are, but I think I can get us up to that catwalk. Uh, all right. Do you have any sort of particular objection to these doors here? We don't know where Isabel went. I suppose that's true. Well, Sybil, you were on your way down the hall. You see door on the right, door on the left, another door on the left. Go further down. There's a door all the way at the very far end. Another door on the left. A lot of choices here. Oh, there's even a door straight across from the initial double doors as well. Yeah, uh, I think I will go along the, I guess the south, the south side, and uh, and listen at, at at each door until I hear something. Yeah, do a hunt roll. Uh, three. You're going to encounter something terrible. The first door on the south side, you put your ear up to it and you hear a cacophony of wild cat roars. Just like, like tiger growls. Like, you know, that, that growl the tigers do that like really loud and then like an occasional like rawr, rawr. and it sounds like there's a, there's a bunch in there <laughs> um, assuming you keep going <laughs> um, yeah I'm not gonna I'm not gonna open that <laughs> and you go to listen at the other door on the south side uh, that one actually there's no sound at all coming from that one just dead quiet let me go over to Horagust. Horagust, what are you up to? I think Horagust is, um, he's starting to get a bit of movement back into his fingers and elbows um, for now. So, and except there's a small fine dust of, you know, crystal crumbling off his hand. So he's a bit worried he's done irreparable damage to his arm. Um, with this little magical stunt, but he's going to go listen at the door directly opposite the double doors they entered in to see if he can figure out what's in there. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I'm going to use my attunement and I'm going to knock on the wood and, um, oh no, maybe what would be better is on the stone around the door and sort of like knock on it and see if I can feel any anything behind the door. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Take your okay. two, di two dice set roll. Okay. A four. Take your token. You're not getting much. And the reason why is because the wood is not of this world. Stonework is not of this world. You don't know the language of this stuff. Mm-hmm. I'll say this is a very strange place and I'll just keep saying I don't like it intermittently until everyone gets sick of me saying it. So Revel, what are you doing? He's going to reach into his bag and pull out a rope and his grappling hook. Okay. And he's going to go stand under the uh, catwalk. You could chuck your rope and grappling hook up there, no problem turn back to the others and say go where she least expect us hopefully I hope you're good at pulling climbing's a young man's game and in case you hadn't noticed my arm grinds and crunches a lot now I could help you with that <laughs> Orla what are you up to um, 
I, I think I'm going to go help Revel with our, our climbing up here. Um, it's a little ways up. I mean, like, it's probably like, uh, it's not a huge, like, climb, maybe 12, 15 feet, if even that. I mean, Re Rebel's got grappling hook. I've got 50 feet of rope. Yeah, you can all so, eventually get up there. You know, tie yeah. it off. And I think, uh, like, like, this doesn't need to be complicated. We can just kind of throw the grappling hook all the way over it, you know, and then when it comes down the other side, we can just hook the hook into the rope itself and just climb up that way. We don't need it, like, because we can loop it over and catch it, it doesn't require that it's secure onto something on the catwalk itself proper. Correct, yeah. Getting up to the catwalk is not a problem with the right equipment, and you have the right equipment. It is just a catwalk, uh, like a, just a little narrow walkway, basically. And you will see somebody coming from the north side. It is a translucent man but not like the translucent men from before. This is like a literally translucent, uh, like you can see on the other side of him. Uh, and not quite a man, a uh, creature that you don't recognize actually. Big bat ears, uh, kind of um, quite prominent lower tusks, uh, dressed in like servant's livery, but ghostly. But they're carrying in their hands very solid plates and cutlery and they're they're walking towards you and and they and they say uh, excuse me excuse me trying to get around you except it can just walk right through you and it does but, but the, well does the plate go right through well it makes you know can raise the plates oh, oh there we go okay oh i like that kind know, of over, overhead like, as you do that. Are, are you headed for the feast sir uh yes yes uh, are you are you here to why why are you here in the servant's catwalk we are here to participate in the feast, sir. Oh, the, the entrance is down below that door right down there. Uh, and and I, I look at the one that he points at. It's the, the, it's the one that was quiet that Sybil got it. checked right. the southerly door. Um, uh, very well, very well. Thank you. Uh, we are, it, it, it is our first time at the feast. Do you have any pointers for us? Well, you might as well come this way. There's no point in you climbing down again. Agreed. Thank you so much. I, uh, I will be sure and tell your masters. Is someone example, going to do something about this rope? With. Is someone going to do something about this rope? Are we just going to leave that out? Tripping hazard and everything? Uh, I'll, I'll start pulling it up. Good. And he goes into this door. It leads to a little kind of raised area that is above the dining room. And he goes down the stairs to, to, to go set the table. What are you all doing? <laughs> I mean, I think Revel Paul, will, oh. he'll, he'll speak to the, the ghost and, and say, we aren't from here. Can you tell us anything about this, this mist? He says, I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but I'm very busy. The guests are almost here. You apparently are a guest, so you are here. And I have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Forgive my rudeness, but someone has to keep this ship ship shape. Very well. Horagus, Sybil, are you all going in? Yeah, I'll, I'll open the door and see what's inside. Yeah, the door's open. Um, oh, it is. Yeah, you can look right in. What you see, you are like in a little like kind of raised area. There's two like flights of stairs that go down on either side. The servants use this to get up and forth or back and forth. Probably the catwalk connects to the kitchen uh, on the other side. But down here in this uh, quite large chamber, this is the feasting hall now, or the dining room. You'll see a dining room. And it's actually in, I would describe it as an advanced state of decay. <laughs> um, it, the table looks, it's unset currently. It's very dusty. Uh, there are cobwebs all over the place. Um, the chairs seem a little busted. Uh, nothing is very well kept. There's no food. 
and you just see this one ghostly sort of creature down there fiddling around with the plates. Let's take a five minute break. So as I described, the dining room doesn't look like it's up to much. <laughs> um, dusty, kind of dingy, table's not really set. Um, even the curtains are like kind of like moldered and, and in shreds. Um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's not great. Mm. Who was first in? I think it was. Probably Sybil. I think it was Sybil. Yeah, because Sybil, so what do you do? Uh, I'll yell out to the, uh, the servant, like, what kind of a feast is this? There's no food. <laughs> he calls back he says from down below oh it's coming it's coming uh, just 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 come down and find your place you're a little early it's like i don't even smell anything come on what what are you cooking oh we have a fantastic menu prepared tonight you're going to love it most of it I mean, it's a numbers game, a lot of courses. You're not going to love everything. I see. And uh, about the, uh, the entertainment, What's, who's entertaining tonight? Well, I don't know about entertainment, but, um, uh, but and he setting things out. He says, mm, I, uh, he comes back up. He says, I have a lot of work to do. And he walks through you back to the catwalk, All back right. towards the kitchen. <laughs> oh, I'll wait for the rest of everyone else, you know, like. Yeah, 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 you're all there. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if this will be uh, a, a, a fruitful feast, as it were. Just... <laughs> Only one way to find out, says Orlin, <clears throat> and like looks back up over his shoulder and as soon as the servant is like out of sight, um, I, you know, like immediately focus my attention on the table and I'm picking up forks and looking at them and kind of buffing them to see if they're real silver or just plated. And, you know, like I'm, I'm looking for that. I'm looking at, to say like, is this real silverware or, or is it as dingy um, as the rest of the place? It's, it's, it's very tarnished if it is. I mean, it's very, very tarnished. I'll tell you, at a glance, I'll tell you that. If you want to go deeper, I'll give you a hunt roll, but. Oh yeah, yeah, I want to go deeper. Like I said, I'm going to, you know, bring it up and give it a little bite and see if oh, Okay, it, go ahead, know, yeah, sure. Is it, is it solid? Is it plated? Is it, you know? Yeah, whatever. yeah. So, um, I want to see if I've got any. I don't think I really have any equipment or or skills that. Oh, um, so here's so here's a skill that I have that I am not entirely sure what it means or or, or what we're how, how we use it, uh, and it's masking. Hmm. Uh, and and is that for like when people are trying to conceal things or whatever or? Well, so there's a skill called obfuscation, which probably is that. I don't know what, what do you suppose masking means? <laughs> I don't know, just look up the definition. I don't know. Like, like I wonder if it was like, 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 like mask. Like, like I, I had funerary masks in mind with that because it goes with my undertaker skill. Um, but oh, I don't oh, it know. goes with your undertaker skill. Yeah. Um, so according um, to the internet, um, it could be several different things. Uh, it could be a recording technique in which a sound or message is recorded backward onto a track meant to be played forward. I don't think it's that. <laughs> um, no, it's not like, like the Beatles Butcher album or anything. Yet. I think it's, yeah, I think it's probably more this, a process in which an individual changes or masks their natural personality to conform to social pressures. So you know what, which is something undertakers do. That's all what they the do time. all the time. Yeah. They all, cool. they, all right. Yeah. Okay. So. And you know what, I've kind of been role-playing that sort of without, 
you mm -hmm. know, just sort of yeah. like ingratiating myself and being and glad handing mm -hmm. people and stuff like that. So, okay, all right. Then, then I don't like, this is just a one die hunt roll as far as I can tell. I don't think I have anything that can help me, you know, determine the veracity of this, uh, or quality of this silverware, so. Four. Take a token. You are there checking out this silverware. I don't think you're able to determine if it's anything valuable or not, but periodically you'll look at the table and you'll notice that on one end it's slowly changing like very slowly and the change is getting very slowly closer further down the table so it starts as a sort of rotten wooden trestle table but it begins changing to be a table draped with a beautiful white tablecloth. And if you watch it for a moment, you can just see the change overcoming the table, overcoming uh, the whole room even. I'm really curious. I'm gonna, you know, my filthy dirt encrusted, uh, you know, sooty hands, I'm gonna put them right down on the table as that wave passes by and see if it affects how I look. Indeed, they become cleaner. The fork, becomes beautiful silver. The rest of you will notice this change. It's happening on the whole room. What was a kind of, uh, let's look at the map. Well, there's nothing specific on the map, but like what was a, you know, on flanking, they love their tall brand, brass candelabras, flanking that door, you know, one of the doors, uh, the tall brass candelabras become beautifully polished, right? The um, kind of, uh, I think there's like a sort of rusted iron chandelier that begins changing to a crystal chandelier, right? There's this change very slowly creeping up through the room. Horror guess, what do you do? I'm going to pull out my tuning fork that I stole from the dining table of the swirling court and I'm going to start hitting bits of it to see if I can figure out if it's real or if this is a glamour or if there's actually like a material change like ding, ding, ding. yeah go for it yeah make a hunt roll it's great okay add it to five take your token it is a glamour The sometimes you can tell as you're tapping it that the, sometimes it's not there, you know, or like it, the, the resonance is not correct. Um, even sometimes if you get really close to something, you can even see, you can even see past the falsehood back to the original thing, but you have to really focus. Which begs the question, is the whole castle like that? Mm. It's fake, it's all fake. Revel, what are you doing? The servant went back up the catwalk? Uh, yeah, back towards the, presumably where the kitchen is. I'm gonna follow the servant. Huh. Let's cut to that. It goes through the door on the other side of the mirrored hall, the other side of the catwalk. There's some stairs that go down and Indeed, uh, it leads to a kitchen, a large kitchen. You can see a dozen of these ghost-like sort of goblin-like creatures dressed in their, their, uh, their amber-colored servant's livery, uh, preparing a large meal. Um, the servants are perfectly transparent and, but the food, a little less clear whether it's real or not. Seems real, but seems more substantial than them at least. What do you do? He'll uh, just kind of slowly walk 
down the stairs looking around and and uh see if he can find a like a cooking station left un unattended see so get to the bottom of what's going to be served one of the servants will look at you and say what are you doing in here Oh, well, back home, I fancy myself a bit of a chef, and I'm always curious how others make do in the kitchen. Well, we're, we're, we're very busy, and we have a system, and... All cause no trouble. <sighs> they're, they're, <laughs> and they're like, well, what do you want to do? Would you like to cut an onion? <sighs> Yes, that I would love to assist. Well, no onions need cutting. What a shame. Maybe you should go back to the feast hall. Well, I will say that if you were working for my family, there would be more than enough of uh, help for all of you. You wouldn't be worked this hard. Maybe we like the work. Do you like the work? They all go, yes. The work is fine. Do do you though? Do do you enjoy the the ambers? Well, they're peculiar, but oh, we don't see much of the living ones anymore. Well, much. But are they good to you? You're all kind of looking around. Are you trying to inspire some sort of workers' rebellion right now here in the castle? I wouldn't dream of it. I'm merely making sure that you know that there are other options out there. Other options? Like what? Do you have a pamphlet? The thorns in Amberette are quite generous with their servants. What is Amberette? Uh, is that a minor, a minor amber house or something? It's only the greatest city in all the land. Perhaps it's too far. Never from heard of it. <laughs> well, is there anything I can assist with? They all kind of look at each other. And they're like, sure. And we'll come back to this. Meanwhile, in the feast hall, Sybil, what are you doing? The room is gradually becoming more and more ready for service. Yeah. Um, hmm. So I'll look around again for. Uh, for like bell chains and uh, <laughs> and send such things. Uh, to like ring for someone. Yeah, I like yeah. pull it in the <laughs> yeah, rings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, make a hunt roll just for looking around. You might not find that, but you might find something else. All right. Uh, hmm. Me too. You encounter something terrible. Let me take a look what you might encounter. <laughs> you are poking around, trying to find a bell chain. Should be fairly obvious, but at a glance, you don't see anything like that. The room is slowly becoming, you know, more and more presentable, changing. And you
realize that there's something atop one of the chandeliers. If you look up to get a better look, you will see that a large dog-sized spider is clinging to the top of the chandelier. And its fangs, or its, not fangs, its mandibles, are kind of opening back and forth, opening and closing. It's got rows of red eyes. And it leaps down at you. You are gonna have to combat this thing, everybody here. If you wish to combat it, you can. It jumps down. Please describe whoever's doing the combat. Please describe how you're vulnerable and roll weak point. Uh, have a week of five. Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to dodge out of the way and maybe get back at it with my, my sling. Uh, you know, trying to get some distance. Me. Yeah. 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 Uh, who else is fighting it? Horogast, you fighting it? Yeah, I think Horogast is vulnerable because, um, He's so intent on his tuning fork exercise that he's completely not paying attention to what's going on around him. Nice. What's your big point? Uh, five. 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 All right. I'll, I'll and... jump in. I'll jump in as well. Mm -hmm. How are you vulnerable? But I'm vulnerable because I've already sat down. <laughs> good <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like ready to go for the feast and suddenly this and i you know i have to like kick the chair back and <laughs> jump up good. and stuff my weak point's three fabulous let's do a combat three civil go ahead and roll uh combat three you were looking for uh seven got it oh, okay two sixes box cars and no weak points you are able to dispatch the spider easily uh describe the first part of the combat round civil how's it go uh, I think I, yeah, I, I dive out of the way and, you know, wind up my sling and uh, hmm, maybe I take those, I still have those herbs, right? But they're not um, not entirely useful to me, but uh, I'll, I'll sling the herbs a lot like with a rock into the spider's mouth. So it numbs <laughs> the, the spider. Nice. Uh, keep it going, horror guest. And then when the spider sort of is stupefied and thrashing around, her guest will be like, I'll teach you to be. <laughs> and I'll start stabbing it with my tuning fork. Take that, you damn illusion. <laughs> Orlin, finish the spider off. I, I just, like I said, I kick back the chair that I'm standing in. And this is a pretty big spider. So I just reach around, you know, and take the chair and just bam, wham, wham, just smash the spider. <laughs> nice, good. And it is, it is, and it stops moving. Horror guest, roll a gold dice seven. Oh, oh, I so will. Let's have a look. Oh, are you kidding me? No, no gold. <laughs> no gold. In fact, we explain this away because as soon as you start to try to see what parts might be valuable on the spider, two of the ghostly uh, the ghostly servants come in and they're like, what in the world? And they go over to the spider carcass and they begin, they're like, get this out of here. And they lift it up and they're carrying it off <laughs> to get it out of the dining room. Oh, how embarrassing. I'm very sorry. And they go up the stairs to do something with the spider carcass. Revel, you have been set uh, to the most tedious uh, work imaginable. Essentially, um, you have been put on salad duty and they want everything to be cut in a very particular way. And I think like they're making like backhanded compliments about your cutting skills as you do this. 
They're like, well, that's certainly not the ugliest julienne carrot I've ever seen. Good job. <laughs> and so forth, right? And they're just watching you, like as if to say, are you satisfied yet? Have you gotten what you want out of this yet? And as he's doing it between the, the little, the slight compliments, he'll be kind of just chatting just on and on just, oh, well, back at home, we used to do things this way and that way and, and talk about the way things are in the Thorn household. You're very, very fond of talking about being back at home. It makes one wonder why you are not back at home, doesn't it? Well, the damnedest thing, we went to sleep on a, a camping expedition and awoke here. They don't seem particularly shocked by that. <laughs> and they say, well, of course you did. You're a guest at the feast. Is, is that how the Ambers invite people to their feasts? Well, we find that people end up where they're meant to be, by hook or by crook. And how did you end up here? And then they all look at each other. They say, we're, we're dead. We're ghosts. We can't leave. It is our haunt to be here. doing this work. Well, and he'll, he'll kind of pause in his, his cutting and, and say, you're very forthright about such things. And they just kind of look at each other like, oh, are you almost done cutting those carrots? I, yes, I suppose I am. I'll kind of push it away and-, and Splendid. You did a really, really um, interesting job. Uh, uh, aggressively adequate, I'd say. Well, I hope it's not too much trouble for one of you to go up behind me and finish off. <laughs> and they, they take over, uh, redo the carrots right in front of you. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your hospitality, such as it is. And so, back in the dining room. <laughs> At a certain point, guests begin arriving. They are filing in 12 men and 12 women in very fine garb. They file into the room. They're coming in through mainly, uh, well, really only the door that connects up with the, uh, uh, with the, with the main hallway, um, the mirrored hallway. They're coming in, they're filing in. They are faintly transparent, much like the servants. Most of these guests are human, though some are other species that look somewhat familiar to you, but you don't quite recognize. They look mostly human, different sizes mostly. And they come in and they all take seats. You hear, you will notice that there are empty spots with name tags and your names written on them, including your actual name, Revel, not the fake name you've been using. What do you all do? I mean, sit right down. There's chatter going on. They're all chit-chatting and talking and there's a little bit of laughter and, um, nice porcelain plates and things are laid out, crystal goblets and all this other stuff. But of course, if you stare really hard, you can tell it's not really what it appears to be. 
Sybil and Horagus, do you take your seats? Yeah, uh, and I'll you know, ask whoever's sitting next to me, like, you been in the one of these before? What's uh, what's the food like? Yeah, a faint, ghostly person sitting next to you, very short, probably no more than three feet tall, uh, quite large, hairy feet, no shoes, says, uh, "Oh yes, yes, um, and the food is splendid, really, really good. I think you're going to like it. The Ambers are consummate hosts, if nothing else." Our guest is convinced that nothing in this room is to be trusted, including the food. So he's just going to sit there and go like this, like and just sort of glare at everyone suspiciously. Revel, do you are you there? Do you take a seat? Yeah, I'll come in uh, uh, just a few minutes behind everyone else and sit down, looking more than a little confused about everything that just happened. And Orla and I assume you're taking a seat, or you were earlier, so. <laughs> uh, the question came up, should you name the spider at the bestiary? I don't know, it's just a spider, it's just a big one, you know? Kind of begs the question if it's anything special beyond that, but you know, if anyone has any ideas, I'm open to it. So, the meal comes, there are many courses <laughs> um, it, it, uh, and, and, and I have to tell you all of them. It's important you know all of the various courses. First, we get a gigantic tureen of onion soup is brought in and it's ladled out into bowls. The guests begin drinking it. They're able to pick up the spoons and things, but this, and the soup just goes through their body and spills on the chair but they seem to be enjoying it, even though they can't actually consume it. Do you all eat the soup? Oh yeah, tuck, tuck right in. Soup I'm gonna pretend, delicious. Yeah, hmm? I'm gonna pretend to eat the soup, but uh, like secretly tip it under the table. Ah, uh, very good, very good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, just in, investigate the soup like, it's good, 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 good whiff, you know, and uh, try to tell if there's any trickery. Okay. Mm. I'll give you this for free. It smells good. It smells like onion soup. Rich, savory. All right. I'll eat, eat up then. Revel to eat soup. I do. Then comes a wine course. Uh, the wine is a special vintage. Uh, produced by the family. It is amber wine. It is even amber in color. Uh, interestingly, that's sort of golden brown. Can I spend one of my hunt tokens here to tuck a bottle of that into my Absolutely. Yes. pack as treasure? Spend a token, you could have a bottle of amber wine, one gold. I'll do the same actually, Nabs, because it's an easy way of pretending I drank it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you are still you are not consuming any of it then, or I guess. Okay. Uh, but Revel I, will do the same, but also take a sip, a generous sip. It's delicious, uh, and yeah, you can all swipe bottles of amber wine. Uh, no one seems to care. Then comes the aforementioned salad. Um, Horagus, Orlin, and Sybil, you'll be aware that uh, it features uh, probably the most uh, beautifully julienne carrots you've ever seen on a salad. Um, then comes uh, a main course of roast beef. Delicious, nice, like kind of red, you know, center. There's a bread course. There are green beans apparently. Mushrooms and wine sauce. Then comes just some regular red wine. It's going on and on. <laughs> Dessert is an apple strudel. 
which I personally love. Um, and then you finish it with brandy. It is a pretty fabulous meal. Everyone who partook of the meal, I need you to tell me which of the courses was your favorite and which was your least favorite. And let me know in chat, please. So Revel enjoyed the brandy, disliked the mushrooms. Sybil's favorite was the mushrooms. <laughs> uh, uh, least favorite was the strudel. What about you, Orlin? <laughs> you can just tell us that out loud, <laughs> Orlin. <laughs> there's, there's no reason for oh, oh, when you when you said in chat, I thought you meant like there was some kind of secret behind oh, this. Well, I, 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 I was going to kind of play it that way, but you guys can just say okay. it. it's fine. Yeah, all right. Uh, my favorite was the green beans, mm -hmm. which were a staple of my days as a gentleman farmer, but which I've not had since my farm fell to plague. And so they're just a, a delight. And you know, steamed perfectly. There are the, the haricots there, the little skinny ones and stuff. So that was lovely. Brandy is disgusting. It always has been. I don't know why anyone drinks it. And uh, you know, you get a tiny little bit of it in a great huge glass, and it's never made any sense to me at all. And um, uh, the, I didn't allow it in my house. But Revel, you enjoyed the brandy, right? It's alcohol. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what didn't you like about the mushrooms? Not a fan of uh, of mushrooms. The the it's whole little... concept. <laughs> Fair enough. Sylvia, you've told us that uh, you like the mushrooms, though. Mm. Yes. Uh, you know they got that great. Uh, caramelization going on and then the you know the, the wine and, and the, the cream sauce you know it's been reduced you know it's in like the pan sauce it's, it's, it's primo yeah sounds great what about the strudel was so unappealing uh is this I a raisins so, no raisins thing i think Sybil just doesn't like apples like it's just apples are are not good you know just, <laughs> the devil's fruit Indeed, indeed. Well, Revel, you enjoyed the brandy. It was warm, it filled your belly and gave you that nice, pleasant buzz. Uh, and it's great. You dislike the mushrooms. And that's probably because, well, let's face it, you're eating the mushrooms. Ever since you've eaten the mushrooms, you are starting to feel a little um, not well. I don't know how much you know about fungi, but you generally avoid the red capped ones with white, with white dots on them. Not in Castle Amber. Um, they, uh, they were cooking with the wrong mushrooms and you can feel yourself as the dinner wears on getting kind of sick. And yet, Sybil, you love the mushrooms and 
they, it was an unusual choice for a mushroom, uh, but didn't affect the flavor and you feel fine. But you didn't like the strudel. And the reason why you didn't like the strudel is because ever since you've eaten it, you can hear everyone else at the table. You can hear what they're thinking about you. Particularly beautifully dressed noble woman smiles graciously and you just hear her in her thoughts. Oh, what a tragic choice of shirt they're wearing. Maybe I should say something. I don't know. They're probably completely hopeless. And another ghostly man raises a glass at you, Sybil, smiles and says, to your health. And uh, instead, he just says, oh, they are really in for it, aren't they? They have so many terrible things to look forward to here in Castle Amber. I hope you enjoy your last meal. You can hear what all the guests are saying. You have a condition of telepathy. <laughs> um, write it down in your conditions. Orlin, your favorite was the green beans. And as well, they should be, they were delicious. And your least favorite was the brandy. Uh, the last part of the meal, I think the reason why you don't like the brandy is because as it goes down your gullet, you see yourself becoming translucent like the other guests. One of the other guests says, oh, seems like you may be joining us for future feasts, friend. <laughs> Not if I have to drink more of this brandy, I say. Well, <clears throat> and Revel, you're very, very ill at this point. I think you throw up at the table. And there's an awkward like, are you going to do something about your friend? You clearly need your help. Or I guess, what do you do when you see that Revel's getting violently ill? Let me think about this. I um, I think I'm going to unfold the contents of his stomach to purge his system. You're gonna do what? Oh, unfall. <laughs> Good, yeah. Unfall ritual. I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would actually probably work for Orlin too, uh, because Orlin, the brandy is making Orlin turn into one of these ghosts, right? If you want to do it on we both of them, could could we treat it as a single like ritual? Absolutely, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And like I said, unfalling the food out of their system. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and I think for my my skill again, I'll say that I have rituals as my yeah. as my skills. So. Well, so what could go wrong? Like Jim, Drew. Well, it affects all the guests. Oh, interesting. Well, except they're all like translucent. All their food's just on their chairs. <laughs> so. Except, well, and then it could, I, I mean, all the guests meaning like Sybil, him, oh, and it's oh, not, oh, it's oh, not okay. just what we just ate. It's mm. everything explosively. Yeah, mm, fun. Um, I think probably what could happen here is it just maybe it's just too powerful and the whole room just becomes like kind of gravity reversed and it's just a big mess. Any other thoughts? 
that's what I was thinking. Everyone kind of goes up to the ceiling. Yeah. Well, you have a light die, devil's bargain, something that will happen no matter what. And I think I'm going to retcon this and say that Revel did not throw up because that would doesn't really work so much with trying to like pull the poisoned food out of his body. So we'll just say that didn't happen. Oh, well, um, he's lo looking green. Yeah. 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 You can see it's happening, though. You can see, yeah, he definitely looks very ill, right? Uh, okay. Devil's Bargains. Who has an offer? Uh, the spell doesn't happen in time to prevent the hallucinogenic effects of the mushroom taking effect? In, in short, Revel's going to be kind of useless for a bit. Mm, I see. You're like kind of gotcha. Interesting. Um, no matter what, the Oh, no matter what, whoever's in that room where the, whoever or whatever is in that room where the tiger or the tiger or the, the cat, wild cat noises are happening, that enters the dining room from that door that connects them. Mine is that regardless of the outcome, this will earn us the like contempt and scorn of the servants forevermore. Like they are not gonna like us after this, regardless of how this comes out. I think I really like the idea of what's in the wildcat room coming in here. So I'm gonna pick that one because that that's like something out of Troika. <laughs> uh, Mike, did you have offer or? Nope. Um, I I like those those last two though. So very good. Uh, okay, you got two light dice. Do a dark die as well. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Oh, are you kidding? I got a three. <sighs> Would you like to add dark dive? Oh, you, 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 you know it. You know it's going to happen. Oh, let's just do it. I got a six go. on the dark dive. Ruin is going up, but you got a six. Um, full success. Describe how you save your companions from their strange fates so basically i am um, raise my hands and i sort of start chanting and they all this sort of like these bubbles almost like kind of come you know like like everything starts lifting a little bit like all the cutlery and the ghosts and all you know everything sort of starts lifting off the ground a bit and um and that the food just kind of bubbles out like, you know, like liquid in zero gravity out of their mouths. And then they sort of collapse down and everything goes <laughs> and lands again. And then I look at my arm and it just falls off. I think that the ghosts, all, they all start to get up. And they're like, well, that's a, a fine bit of entertainment at the end of dinner. And they'll get up from their spots and they begin like arm in arm going out of the, of the dining hall, back out into the mirrored hall. They don't even open the door, they just walk through the doors. The servants are coming and they begin like clearing everything up. And then the door to that room, the, the dining room connects up to that room where the wildcat sounds were coming from, that door creaks open and the ghostly servants, they, they're like, oh, um, oh, and they like, hurry to leave, <laughs> to like get the stuff and like go upstairs and kind of leave you there. What do you all do? Let's start with Orlin. When you see that door open, actually, I'm going to start with Sybil because Sybil, you heard really clearly what was coming from that room or what was in that room or something, <laughs> some idea. And, and Sybil didn't just have their dinner come back. Precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Sybil, what do you do right now? Yeah. Um, so I still have telepathy? You do, yeah. <laughs> okay, so what, what are the servants? What do they think? Is um, they're, they are... Um, they don't want to get in the way of the Amber's uh, present disagreeable guests. House guests who are coming through. Okay. okay. Uh, then I'll like try to gather up my companions and, and like rush out of hmm, where? Probably across the catwalk. Oh, so going back upstairs, following the servants, basically. Mm -hmm. Do you all hurry with, or do you stop to wait to see what comes through the door? Revel's going to take Sybil's advice. Orlin Horacus, do you leaving as well? I will. I'll um, I'll gather up my now calcified arm and stuff it in my backpack and, and rush off gr clutching at the stump of my arm. Indeed. As you, whoever's last, we'll say it's Orlin. And that As makes you, sense. I mean, like, like I kind of look, I look, and then clearly the consensus is that we're leaving. So I might be caught kind of halfway in between. So, yeah. You see a pair of quite large humanoids come through the door. They are wearing fine, brilliantly, uh, or like vividly decorated and, and, and dyed leathers. Um, and they have the heads of great cats, tigers, and they have weapons on their hips and they step through, they walk on two legs, but they look like heads of tigers. And they come in and like, oh, we missed the feast again. And they sort of like growl and grumble. And then they're they're kind of just like, like kind of tossing some plates here and there. And they're like, oh, we'll get it next time. Come on. As it happens, my friends, I saved a bottle of wine from the feast and I will haul out my bottle of wine. Perhaps we could share a drink together. Ah, there is a good man. It's good to meet someone in this damnable house after so long who knows their stuff. So. Uh, and I will approach them with the, you know, and I'll, I'll just grab a couple of, you know, whatever goblets off the table and kind of set them down. And I'll pop the cork and I'll start pouring. And 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 I get that this means I'm using it as equipment instead of turn being able to turn it in for a gold later. So that's totally cool. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I am saying, uh, um, uh, with your resplendent countenances, sir, you clearly do not resemble uh, any of the uh, uh, Amber family that we have met so far. Perhaps you are a particularly uh, attractive offshoot uh, that we haven't had the pleasure to be introduced to yet. <laughs> what a charmer. And then they like, they call to their other friends in that room and there's like fully six of them and they all come in, they all file in uh, these like large cat people and they, they, uh, yeah, they, 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 they take the, they grab goblets or whatever's around and they, they take, you know, they take your wine and, and they're drinking up and they're saying, uh, well, this is, this is fine. This is a fine vintage. What, 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 what are you doing here? We find ourselves here uh, quite unexpectedly. We were uh, traveling to the location where, a location where we had hoped to find treasure, adventure, that sort of thing. We are men of the road and uh, uh, we went to sleep. One of our companions, was tasked with keeping watch, but alas, uh, uh, when he was distracted, uh, we were brought here. Uh, I believe the remains of our campfire still rest in the carpet in the foyer. Oh, well, you should do like we did and ask, ask Stephen Amber yourself uh, whether you can make, you know, make, make one of these rooms your lair. Hmm. We like this one over here that we've shacked up in, made it comfortable. We had to get rid of all the furniture. 
have you have you met the boxer next door? Uh, uh, with your sturdy frame, sir, you could perhaps uh, take quite a bit of his silver. Ah, uh, yes, John Lewis Ambo. We know him and we hear him frequently. He is, uh, as far as the Ambers go, fairly insignificant member of family. Yeah. Mm, uh, perhaps, but as I said, uh, uh, insignificant or not, his, his silver is still silver. Can, uh, can this conversation and kind of, you know, going back and forth with them lead to a hunt roll? Uh, yeah, I think so. Especially okay. using the amber wine. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. If you're trying to find, we're trying to find out something. What do you, what in particular are you trying to find out? Um, um, uh, I want to find out like their place in the ecosystem here. Oh, good. Okay. You know, okay. like, like, do they just sit in that room all the time? Do they go out and hunt? Do they, you know, like they got to eat somehow? How does that happen? You know, I, I, I think when he says that thing about a lair, I'm like, Tell me more about how, you know, what it means to have a lair here when you're not a member of the Amber family. So, uh, so yeah, let me go ahead and do a hunt to you here. I got a six. Take a token. They explain to you that, they explain to you that they arrived at Castle Amber um, a number of days ago and that they were looking for lodging um, on their way en route to somewhere else. And then the mist rolled in and they haven't been able to leave. And so rather than skulking about and trying to, uh, you know, like, like they, they did their best to basically try to fit in. And so they actually sought permission of, 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 of the Amber family to stay in, uh, to stay here, to, to claim a room for their own. And it was granted, and that's the room they got. Uh, and I kind of, you know, wave to my, my friends as they're heading out and then, please join us, my friends, come down. Let, let me introduce you to my traveling companions, I'd say. And these creatures, um, they, they introduce themselves, they have names that you can't pronounce and that uh, you may not even remember after this is all over. And yeah, they are warriors. That's their whole thing. Uh, they're always seeking like, they're always seeking like a, a uh, like a supreme challenge, right? They're always on the lookout for someone to, uh, to, to, to match their skills against a truly great worthy foe. They're probably not involved or interested in the boxing precisely because there are no worthy foes to be found there. Um, no disparagement against Sybil's boxing talents, of course. And yeah, they're reasonably friendly. Um, they're a little aloof, maybe. Have, have they met Isabel? Uh, yes, they know Isabel. Um, and they think that Isabel is scared of them. We ask them about the other rooms on the other side of the hallway, perhaps. Say that again, August. Can we ask them about the other rooms on the other side of the hallway that we haven't been to? What yeah. Than those? Yeah. Uh, well, the kitchen's straight across, and then uh, next to there, well, at the very, very beginning of the hallway, um, they haven't investigated that part yet. Uh, they were sort of warned away from that part of the house. That's those three little tiny rooms on the on the Western side. But then uh, there is a bedroom um, and there is, I have to look. Oh, it's just two bedrooms on the other side. Now on the map, of course, is a third thing, but you, don't, you can't see that because it's behind the secret door, but, and they're not aware of it. But, uh, but there are two bedrooms in the kitchen and then these like little uh, kind of tiny little like auxiliary rooms, which uh, they, they were, they have it on good authority not to go into. Yeah, I think I will um, try to get some information out of them. Basically, uh, gossiping about what is the most um, 
salacious rumors about this place. Um, and hopefully they will, will say one thing and think another. <laughs> uh, you can do a hot roll. Yeah, see what they give up. Go for it. Okay. Uh, so can I use my trickery skill? Sure, yeah. Uh, six. Take your token. They, they will tell you that in hold on, I'm gonna cough. They will tell you that in one of the bedrooms there is a an amber named Janet Amber. But they haven't seen Janet come out of the room in about two days at this point. And they think there might be something going on in there. They don't know for sure. And one of their numbers has gone in to actually look and see what happened but he won't tell the others uh and he's very he seems very amused by what he saw and now it's just a game with them to figure out what's going on in that room they could just walk in and look of course but now they they try to engage him they to like to kind of suss out what he saw and he gives them clues periodically but they haven't guessed it yet. And on the map, that would be the room that is uh, labeled 10. Where Janet Amber is supposed to be. Let's take five. So yeah, they tell you this, that they know that Jane Amber stays in that room across the way. They haven't seen her in a couple days. One of their companions did go in to look and he's being very cagey and coy about what he saw. Um, so yeah. Sybil, what do you do? Uh, then yeah, I'll, I'll basically just try and try to um, prime his, his thinking, right? Um, like, oh, well, what could be in there? You know, what, what is this? Is it this or that? You know, and um, yeah. See if I'm, you can telepathically figure it out. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Just try, yeah. Trying to get, get him to think about it. Um, do, a, do a hunt roll. All right. Uh, I think still using trickery. Another six. Nice, take your token. You get a glimpse into what, what this creature saw. He snuck into Jane Amber's room and he saw a large hulking creature, like seven or eight feet tall, very wide at the shoulder, uh, muscular, uh, filthy, basically cracked open Jane Amber's rib cage and was eating the guts and the meat from her on her bed. And then he watched it for a time and it took Jane Amber's nightcap or little night stocking, put it on its head carefully, gently, even looking in Jane Amber's mirror, blood and viscera dripping from his hands and 
mouth. All right. Uh, I so I'd like to turn this into a betting game. Right? Okay. <laughs> they're trying to like they're trying to guess what it is, right. but I want I want to play like I'm guessing and and take some some gold off them. Oh, good. I like this. They'll all throw in uh, some little wagers can happen. Um, really sell this and I'll give you a gold for it. All right. So yes, I'm, you know, going on and, and on about like um, the, uh, the, I don't think they we've named their, the cat man who is giving the clues. Oh, they'll, they'll tell you, they'll tell you their, what their species is called. If you okay. want to know. They sure. are called uh, Rakasta. Okay. Uh, so the, the Rakasta uh, who's, who's giving out the clues, like he'll give a clue and then I'll give a clue. You know, and be like, oh, is that right? You know? Um, and just, just get closer and closer and, and try to egg them on um, without uh, without tipping my hand. Yeah, and they're like, I think he's... I. I can tell he's almost got it. I can see it on your face. He's almost got it. And you know, they're just kind of egging each other on and stuff. Yeah. And then eventually you guess. Yeah, yeah. And then they ask their companion, is that correct? And he says, well, how do you describe it? Like, what do you say? Uh, hmm. Let's see, I... What are those caps called? Uh, besides the nightcap, like uh, um, yeah, I was trying to think of like what, what that might be. What is that? Um, like a yeah, I don't, I don't bonnet. Know. A what? Like a bonnet? No. Oh, no, a bo- oh bonnet's good. Yeah, you say bonnet. Sure, yeah, bonnet's sure. Good, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it's like you know, and I'll lean in like it's a campfire story. You know, it's like oh well. It was a great white beast. It was it was a cannibal, and it had a bonnet on its head. You know, it t- took it off and put it on. And he, he confirms that you're correct, and the rest like send up a cheer, uh, and yeah, and they 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 toss their coins at you. You know, one fair and square, uh, it's equal to one gold. You can mark it. Okay. Do I do I spend a hunt token to get? No, that you can order? have that for free. Okay. Yeah. All right. Like your plan, um, Rebel. What are you up to right now? I figure he took a, a swig of his wine and kind of rinsed around his teeth before swallowing it, and then uh, he's probably flirting with someone. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, you've got your choice of very fine-looking cat people. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, Rakastas there. Um, uh yeah i think you know they'll they they might want to know like maybe one of them has like a large sort of tell me about the waters of your home world oosel moment with you right like you know what is uh what's what's it like where you're from you know i revel will, will kind of be trying to ingratiate himself with them get close to someone and then if they need help they have someone to call Ah, good. I think you're all pretty well in with this group of Rakasta at this point. I mean, they are, they're, they're good natured. Um, they, they're stuck here like you. <laughs> um, they, uh, they are content to, I mean, they do spend a good portion of their day sleeping. And so they don't really have to get up too much. Um, if you look in their little room, they have moved all the furniture out and it's just, uh, it's just like, uh, like, like bedrolls and pillows and cushions on the floor that they kind of lounge about on or whatever. They're just waiting for the mist to rise. Sleeping away the days. That's or my the, favorite way to spend them. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think since we've all, you know, like, um, I mean, I think we've kind of gotten out of them what we can. Um, 
So, I mean, I'm going to ask them. Um, I mean, so, so they, they've never been out of this hall? They haven't gone any further into the castle? Well, part of the agreement of getting their own room is that they wouldn't do that. Yeah, OK. So. OK. Um, did they have to pay anything for it or, or no. offer any kind of service? They just, they just said that and... Well, as best you can tell, they just sort of uh, put it to whichever Amber they spoke to and- Got it, okay. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think then just, um, I'm gonna say, well, my friends, I mean, I think, if, I don't know if the rest of you are as curious about the fate of Janet Amber as I am, I mean, you know, <laughs> now <laughs> what, what happened? Well, but, but I mean, is this a, a well, I, we, we, we don't know what happened. We know what the cat man told us happened. Yeah, but he um, thought it, yeah. Yeah, but it, it but um, I mean, is this, so, uh, you know, was, was this the death of a member of the Amber family that nobody seems that distraught about? Or is this some one of these like tableaus that plays out again and again in this strange place? And uh, if indeed she was killed and this creature took her nightcap and that's what it wanted, perhaps this is an empty room that we can ensconce ourselves in. All valid points. So what do you do? Um, I, I say to my friends, let's go explore that room. Perhaps that could be our room. And we could okay. push the furniture against the walls and have, uh, you know, listen for uh, Isabel accosting other guests when they arrive. <laughs> Harrogeth sort of lying, like sitting there, like tying off his sleeve, like cutting it and tying it off over his stump and um, and looking mournfully at it and saying, I don't know if this is just the, the you know, like the fatigue speaking, but I don't want to hang around in this wing for an indeterminate amount of time waiting to die or be eaten or poisoned. I think we should continue. That would be fine as well. Well, Sybil and Revel, what do you think? Revel will kind of almost uh, hesitantly drop the hand of the Rakasta he was talking to and, and turn and say, I don't like the idea of planning for an indeterminate stay here unless we can avoid it. Let's move on, see if we can find our way out of here. Indeed. Sybil, any thoughts? Uh, I think, yes, Sybil goes on about, uh, you know, you can, yeah, you can open the door and I'll wait out here and see what happens. Um, you know, but, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe I, I tell you in whispers, like I saw that thing, and it, you you don't want to deal with it. Oh, Sybil actually saw it. Uh, so sorry, as a player, I misunderstood that Sybil actually saw that. Yeah, yeah, she read. Got she it. Read okay. His mind. Yeah. The, oh, oh, this was yeah. telepathically that right. they. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. so it's not just that 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 the story was related to them. It's that they actually have a picture in a there picture of what I know, saw. actually yeah. what it looks like got it okay okay sorry so as a player i i didn't oh, no make that yeah. connection there so uh um uh very well i say then um uh the rest of castle amber awaits walk out into the hall and down to the end and just you know pull on that door like heading towards the towards the east yeah towards the center of the castle or whatever, further in. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the door opens. 
it opens up to a, um, well, this is, I shall just read it to you because it's a, it's a lot to know. This is a huge octagon shaped building with seven great domes overhead. It is an indoor forest. The domes up ahead, which are exposed to the sky, there's no mist up above. You can see the sunlight coming down. The domes are nearly a hundred feet in the air. It just like goes straight up. And there is, this room is just, there are many trees. Uh, some of these trees reach they look like they go as high as 80 feet. I mean, like great, big, enormous, towering trees. Um, plants, grasses, bushes. It's very thick. You can't see very far ahead of you. You can only really see above. Uh, and otherwise, it's just foliage. But there is a path. And there is a new set goal. The indoor forest set goal is safely reach the bloodstained arch. And you did not accomplish the last set goal, by the way, but that doesn't stop you from leaving, but just a note. Given it's a key, is it in our best interest? I'm, I'm guessing by like how how every single room in this is packed with horrors. Maybe we should save our tokens for when we're like all as a t as a group extremely worn down. Like, uh, but we, I guess we could try and skip and get the key if we had enough tokens. I mean, it seems like. The key would be useful later, right? Goes to something. So it's uh, clearly important because it's set goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, so, I mean, your characters don't know about it, and you, as players, have no idea what it does. But, but uh, it's obviously, yeah, it's it's probably important. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I I could spend two. That's that's fine. And I have one. I'd be willing to put in if we want to solve that first set before we leave it. Might be wise to have that uh, yeah. have that sorted when you run into a silver door. Tokens are spent, and I will tell you, you see, finally, Sipple, a bell pull, <laughs> or a, <laughs> <laughs> um, at that at that end of the hallway near the door to the indoor forest and tied around a velvet rope around it, there is a silver key. Well, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take it off, you know, Potter, who left this out here? <laughs> and who's responsible for it? Are they gonna be angry? You take the key. Are you all going inside the indoor forest or are you gonna go search the other rooms in the West Wing? I'll go for the forest. What could possibly go wrong in such a ridiculously dangerous place? <laughs> I know. And it's a, it, 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 this, like I've said, it's huge towering trees, very, very thick overgrowth or undergrowth, very like lots of thick hedge, uh, tall grasses, uh, a cacophony of animal sounds. I mean, it's like a it's like you're walking through a jungle cafe, you know, except it's, uh, you know, an actual proper forest. There's Can I ask a, path a little there. point of, of clarification, sorry about the, the what it looks like. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So with the roof, with the domes, you said open to the sky. Did you mean like a, like they're like a greenhouse, like a, uh, or are they literally just, there's nothing? Uh, they're glass, they're glass domes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, so it's like a greenhouse, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, thank you. 
No, it's okay. Um, so you can uh, you have your set goal, safely reach the bloodstained arch. One foot forward. Um, if you're staying on the path, you can. That's one thing. You can also leave the path if you prefer to just go wander off the path. That is an option as well. You took the first move here, Orlin. So what do you do? Oh, I breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, finally. Uh, and you know, I pause for a moment and breathe in the you know the scent of stuff here. And I'm just going to start walking down the path. And you know. I'm pointing at trees and identifying them and pointing at different kinds of grass. And I'm trying to get a sense of like, um, is this laid out in some kind of aesthetic way or are they, is it all just, has it grown here randomly? What is the, like, is this an actual garden or, or what, what's going on here? Yeah. Uh, take a, uh, take a hunt roll. All right, and I have plants as a skill. So. I love it. It's a great, I can't imagine a better place to use such a skill. I, I completely agree. I got a five. Take your token, but you encounter something terrible. Up ahead, you see a tree, not 80 feet tall, but a good sized tree. Um, its branches are moving um, like arms and it's currently uh, dismembering a skeleton, cracking the bones um, and crushing them and sprinkling them down to the base of its roots. It's like a big, uh, big oak. Mm, Self-fertilizing. Uh, can it reach the path? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, we will want to avoid that, I think. Uh, let me see. Hmm. Well, we'll notice help. now there is um, a significant amount of movement <laughs> among the trees uh, in this in this part of the indoor forest. <laughs> um, uh, there is no wind rustling through these leaves. These leaves are rustling on their own. I'll. Uh... I'll take my sling, right, and uh, maybe bounce a, a rock off uh, the path up ahead, see what happens. Uh, um, you do that, and a tree branch like a, like just lashes out, like, like whip fast, and just pow, snaps the spot where the stone landed. Can I ask, what's the path made out of? Like, what on the the that we're following? Slate. Can I commune with the path and ask it to yeah. protect us? Yeah. Do a do a uh, well. So this could be a hunt roll if you're or a risk roll if you're trying to actually accomplish a specific task, or if you're just trying to communicate with them. That's probably a hunt roll. What do you think? I think I'm I'm more just trying to get information, basically. Okay. So like attune attunement. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I got a four. Okay, again, the stone is foreign to you, but you get the distinct impression that this is a this is a place of many horrors, many horrors and many beings. Even you are not even close to the only sentient creatures in this forest. The stone will convey that to you. Revel, what do you mm. do? Revel's going to take out one of his torches and light it. Okay. And actually his last torch. And okay. uh, it's going to approach very cautiously, holding the torch out in front and see if the tree uh, moves away or... Ah, very smart, very wise. Um, yeah, I like that. I'm not even gonna make you roll. The tree keeps its distance. It recedes ever so slightly. It gives you, gives you a wide berth if you wave the torch around a little bit. So I'll turn back to the others and say, stick close or light a torch if you have one. 
I'm going to crack out my, because I can't use my hand anymore. I'm going to hold my geode with my left hand, one of my geodes. Indeed. Continuing along the path. You can continue along the path till you get towards kind of more the southerly portion um, of the indoor forest. And you are distinctly aware of shadowy forms creeping about behind bushes, between trees, clearly following you. You've noted them for a little ways. You can hear them rustling the plants as they creep about behind you. Sybil, what do you do? I, I suppose I tried to be the most silent, <laughs> the most unappealing target. What about the rest of you? Do you just ignore these whatever these things are that are creeping about in the shadows? Do you challenge them? I mean, I'm, I'm curious whether the trees, none of, are they on the path at all? Uh, the trees are along the path, but I think you've, you've gotten past them, the angry, violent trees. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so the violent trees are not a, are not an issue anymore. Uh, not at this moment. No, I got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Re Revel's these, trick work to keep them. Back. Yeah. So are the things that following are following us on the path at all, or are they keeping to, they're keeping off the path. Yeah. Got it. All right. You can hear them occasionally disturb the bush or something. And then mm -hmm. catch just a glimpse of a shadowy figure. All right. Um, yeah. Then I'll turn and I'll say, there's no need to skulk about. If you have business with us, conduct your business. If you have a disputation with us, then dispute. <laughs> You'll hear a woman's voice from a little further ahead. And she says, you don't have to worry about them. They won't bother you. Uh, what authority do you have in this matter? Up ahead in the path, you will notice uh, there's a woman who is sort of laying down, draped over a horse that has a single spiraling horn coming out of its head. It's also laying down and they're both looking at you. She is, how to describe her? She's radiantly amber colored, like her skin, um, or even gold, like imagine a gold finger, right? Like that, uh, that woman who is, um, you know, coated with gold, you know, it's, it's like that, her whole, like, but her, her clothing, her skin, her hair, the unicorn is a sort of white with gold flecks in its mane or the, the horse with a single horn coming out of its forehead. And she says, I have been here for a while and those creatures mean you no harm. Just ignore them. Uh, why do they follow us? I'm sure they're just curious about you. Well, what are they? I haven't seen them myself but I know that they're no bother. Mm, not to you, perhaps. Perhaps. Are you, are you a member of the Amber family? No, no, I am not. No, no, I, I like to come to this place though, too. Have you been brought here from another world as we have? Oh, another world. Um, 
no, uh, no, I'm, I think it's just this world. So you're a resident of the castle, but not an Amber? I wouldn't say I'm a resident. I come to stay for lengths of time. Mm. Although so, leaving, leaving is currently not easy to do. Yeah, that we, we've come to discover that. Uh, perhaps with your knowledge of this forest that we find ourselves in, you could guide us safely to the other side. And here, while this conversation is going on, Revel, I'll point out that behind her horse, there's a chest. And the chest is, uh, looks like it's, uh, I don't know, you can kind of see it's filled pretty tight with coins. You can see coins coming out of the seams a little bit on the top. Revel will uh, point that out to uh, Horagust and Sybil and say, that looks an awful lot like bait to me. I think this whole castle is bait, Revel. I think we figured that out a while ago when I lost my arm. Fair point, but that especially. It reminds me of one of those little lights on fishes that live in the deep ocean that they use to lure you in. He'll, he'll call out to the, the woman, do you have a name? Oh, yes. And, and it is? <laughs> oh, I don't think we really need to get to know each other in that way, do we? This is Orlin. This is Sybil. And my friend here is Horgast. Your turn. He's Revel, I say. She says, that too. Wow, how wonderful. Your kind are always so obsessed with identifying ourselves, your strong individuality. And uh, what kind are you, if not one of us? I am not one of you, no. <sighs> she kind of like lays her head down on the horse. And she closes her eyes. She just mutters, the creatures skulking about are no danger. And then she just falls asleep. I don't trust anyone in here that the trees aren't trying to kill. Normally I'd be all over that treasure chest, but this place has not given me any reason to believe there's any actual treasure in it. It's probably fake, like all of that finery in the dining room. If not fake, a good excuse to get us into the jaws of some other monstrosity out here. Perhaps the chest itself would eat us. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at you all, and I think I've probably informed you of this telepathy business um, and uh, ask, uh, well, should I try to read her dreams? Uh, why not? Probably couldn't hurt. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, so it is. I will... Do a hunt roll. Yeah, we'll try. Without the... Uh... Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Ah, okay. Another six. <laughs> I've stolen all the luck today. Very nice. Take your token. You try to peek into her mind, see what she's thinking. And she says, or you hear her speak back to you. Oh, what an interesting little trick. You are certainly more talented than others of your kind. I'm afraid you're not going to find out much from me though. It's like, well, can you at least tell us of the, say the, the dangers in this um, terrarium? Do not linger long or the great hunt will find you. Well, I don't, I don't think we plan to, but uh, it's, it's appreciated. It's like the green dimension all over again. Uh, can't go anywhere without someone trying to hunt you. So the great hunt, this great hunt, are they uh, fearsome warriors? Well, only Sybil is talking to her right now via her mind. Oh, oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll relay what I talked about to y'all, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hmm. well, I don't think I have anything else to ask. Uh, yeah. What about the horse? Can you try reading the horse? <laughs> uh, I could, but I don't think I will. It would be, it would be very strange. You're having this conversation. You're trying to figure out what to do. The woman is seemingly asleep. The horse is seemingly asleep. There are a few birds flying overhead, a rabbit hops across the trail and quite suddenly everything stops. The birds stop in midair, the rabbit stops along the path. The woman's inhalations and exhalations cease. And then there's a light, an amber colored light begins to surround you all. It is warm, it's soothing. Everything outside of the light is stopped, but you all can move freely in the light. You feel better, you feel relaxed, you even feel mended. Reset your ruin to your starting ruin and that ends the session. Stars and wishes. Stars are things you enjoyed about the session. Wishes are things that you hope to see next time. Whoever wants to go first, fire away. Stars, I am enjoying just how buck wild this is. Like. I have absolutely no no predictions for for what's around the next corner cuz who would have expected well I mean angry forest is kind of not that surprising here but golden lady and unicorn didn't see that coming um and and wishes I don't have anything in like specifically just really looking forward to seeing what new uh terrifying probably thing is, is around the next door bend i definitely got a star for james for and then my arm falls off <laughs> which was <laughs> which is a great moment so just like leaning right into that ruin accumulation um you know because because it's all cosmetic because you can still function you know mechanically but it's a great way to to reflect that i i really like that moment that was that was very cool um, uh, start a mic for just, you know, 
leaning right into it, just jumping right in, you know, uh, the, you know, like like you've been a part of the gang all along. Um, and the uh, the the turning down reading the horse's mind, I think was a was a fun little bit. That was like, yeah, no, that'd be weird. So uh, I, I quite like that. That was a lot of fun. Um, and um, uh, uh, started Drew definitely for uh, for just um, uh, going into the kitchen and like pestering the servants because that just felt like such a revel thing to do. It's like, no, 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 come on, give me something to do. Give me something to do. Give me something to do. Come on, I can you know I can hang with you guys. And that was, uh, I, I like that a little bit. That, that was a lot of fun. So um, my wish is for um, uh, going forward for, for, to see how what we've done so far carries through going forward. You know, maybe we can sick the cat men on somebody we don't like or something like that. Uh, but just, just that like, I'm, I'm hoping that it's not a thing where once we've explored the room, it's done, we're done with it. We never think about it again. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how we can kind of, uh, you know, uh, like bring some of that stuff forward. Well, risk rolls are a great opportunity for that, right? So devil's bargain and stuff. Yeah, yeah I agree all that. I, I really liked uh, Orland's, Orland's uh, friend making at every opportunity. Because <laughs> otherwise, I think... At the start, we would have just dungeon crawled, you know. <laughs> so that was that was good. Um, I don't know about wishes. Yeah, I'll have to. Uh... Yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. If you don't have anything, it's fine. Yeah. Um, my stars. Uh, I. This module is so weird. It's such a strange module, and. I do think that like probably when you, this was being run back in the day in BX or whatever, or, or expert D and D expert or whatever it was, um, probably it, it was meant to mostly be like a, uh, like a haunted house thing, you know, like where you just go from room to room and something happens and you go to the next room and something happens. And so it's kind of interesting to try to make it into an ecosystem because I don't think it really like, I don't really think it like intends to be an ecosystem <laughs> as written at least. Um, but I, 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 I hear what you're saying though, Jim, like, like finding ways to make it feel like an ecosystem feels important. You know, we're getting a little bit of that, I think uh, here and there, but yeah, it, it, but as written, it's just, it's truly just meant to be like, okay, I go to the next room and then this weird thing happens. And I go to the next room and this weird thing happens. Right. Um, so that's been kind of, it was, it's fun to kind of like make it, feel a little more um interconnected and a little bit more like everyone's just kind of here for you know like like there's a reason for all of this maybe or or whatever but uh so i, I kind of enjoyed that i think i think it's a fun module i mean it's it's fun it's uh it's just so oddball and uh yeah yeah it's just it's just it's, it's definitely a, a, a strange strange module for wishes um i uh, I do intend to, I'd like to ex kind of explore uh, Sybil's drives a little bit. Uh, I think that'd be good. Um, I think we had a good session just kind of getting Sybil integrated into the group. I think I want to kind of hit on the drives a little bit next time, kind of freshen, refresh everybody else with their drives and kind of see what's kind of, what the thinking is with those and kind of learn more about it. I think I also, I, I, I think it's interesting, but like I'm curious to see, I'm always curious to see in Trophy Gold, but especially with this adventure, because I know it's gonna come up. I'm curious to see about that, like how are we gonna spend the hunt roll tokens when and how, that's always a fun sort of thing to observe as GM. And so I'm very interested to see like what decisions you all make with regards to the hunt roll tokens and when to spend them, like you could, spend them right now in the forest and get and probably get past all this stuff and all the implied dangers that have been hinted at right um so but you know but maybe you don't maybe you like tough it out or whatever you know especially now that all your ruin is reset right um and so yeah i think that's kind of where my head is with all that but yeah any other stars or wishes i think for me the star is i feel like that this 
kind of zany gonzo like setting really suits the play style that everyone's developed and um and Sybil's like character style as well of like trying to befriend and ask questions it's just worked really well and it's fun to see a sort of setting where there's lots of potentially social NPCs or at least I know like you DM them that way it's made it feel really lively and it's got that kind of slightly zany spookiness but it also feels like there's like lots of interlocutors which has made it feel really interesting uh, so I've enjoyed that I think it's given everyone a chance to kind of shine and um yeah I guess my wishes is, is just to see I love how it is just this big haunted house so it is a bit like it feels a bit like being on one of those haunted house rides at a fair you know there's even like a sort of like track that you follow along with the carpet you know seeing what kind of thrills and chills are around the corner well, and it's written thing. that way too like yeah, it's yeah. truly written that way like I'll tell you you're not given any motivations for these creatures in the module I'm having to come up with all that stuff on my own there's no like what are they doing here what are they what do they want there's none of that in the module right it's like you see a woman she's gold she's laying on a unicorn <laughs> like, you know there, there's a treasure chest behind her and like that's it <laughs> it's like no other like it's nothing else there in the text so yeah i also like how it kind of feels like troika but a bit like you know different you know like it's got that it's come out feeling to me a bit like in that sort of I think it's maybe the combination of the, the adventure as written with the trophy kind of laid on top has made it feel like that which I really yeah, enjoy uh awesome was that everybody I think that was everyone right cool uh yeah well so Castle Amber um I think we I mean you got a pretty so far I think if anybody watched this video they would be like yeah that was Castle Amber <laughs> you know I feel like we got a Castle Amber experience even though I had to sort of come up with quite a lot of characterization that is not in the module but um, well, and, and the interesting you know. thing about you saying that Jason is that Goodman Games has announced they're doing that this their, is their, their next revamp, omnibus yeah. module so almost certainly one of the things they're going to have to do is baking Flesh it out yeah exactly yeah. a whole lot of this stuff mm -hmm. so it's going to be like i'm i love the fact that we're going to get to play this for a month and then whenever that comes out months from now you know i'll get to see it and go you know oh yeah that makes sense and, yeah you know yeah. We, we did it and we didn't and stuff so looking yeah right now that. it's super it's just a, it's super it's very haunted house it's uh there are there are almost no NPC motivations or anything like there's nothing like that. I mean, it's like literally just each room is a scary new room, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think like, were all these old modules that way? I don't think so, but this one is. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I mean, that's not, um, not totally true. I mean, some of the Ambers later on are a little more fleshed out, but like not much, like just a tiny bit. So I, so I was 12 when this mm -hmm. came out. Um, so like I actually bought it when it originally came out yeah. and we flipped through it and we were like, I don't understand how we work this into our campaign. Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so I, I never actually ran it or played it. Yeah. You know, it was like one of those modules I had where it was just like, this is bananas, but I don't know how we're supposed to, yeah. like, what I'm supposed to do with this. So, yeah. you know, White Plum Mountain, sure. You can drop that in and you know, whatever they read the poem and they go off and find the artifacts and stuff but this was just a yeah it was just so weird yeah well i mean i, the, never end, I mean, ended up playing it yeah i mean the way i introduced you all to the setting is literally how it goes in the book yeah. like mm -hmm. you 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 make camp and you wake up in the foyer <laughs> you know there's no like <laughs> like there's no uh and, and you are and you are not in your own world like this yeah. is a different world so mm -hmm. yeah i didn't none of that was like improvised that's how it's written so um but anyway all right cool well this was super cool um i am excited to continue and uh, we will see you all next week good night everybody